Welcome to this day and this episode. Thank you. You did a great job. <laughs> um, Christine, I'm just feeling very sing-songy, but tell me about your reasons why you drink. How's your mental Ooh. health, physical health days, the days amongst you? Um, fine. Okay. <laughs> like the sands of the hourglass. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> um fine. I'm fine. We have a big deadline coming up. Uh-huh. That we can't really talk about yet and it's making me want to rip my eyeballs out and I jump off understand. A bridge. Yeah, I also uh, want to jump so off a bridge. I feel like Maybe I'm we can of... tag team and discuss an extension. Oh, okay. Let's do that. Okay. <laughs> that, that was easy. I guess I could have texted you last night when I was having a mental breakdown. I was also um, having a, a menti B, so um a, a little menti B. Um just like a cute anyway, little one. You just made me feel better. So thank you. Uh I'm doing great, Em. Thank you. I just wanted to give a little shout out because Eva reminded us uh that we do have new merch on our merch store. Mm -hmm. And our wonderful merch uh folks are so good at getting like season like stuff out every couple months. So uh we've been having a lot of fun uh, helping with designs and stuff but and brainstorming but we always forget to mention it because it's so regular that they get updated now that i feel mm -hmm. like we never think to mention it um but yeah if you want to check out our merch you should go to atwwdmerch.com i'm wearing um i was gonna wear the goose cam i'm so annoyed i didn't wear the goose cam today but i wore i literally was wearing i was wearing it last night um i also I was got too that's I got why i didn't wear it it smells oh hmm I believe I've that since then. <laughs> <laughs> I ha I was wearing my cauldron shirt. I was getting yeah. all funky with it. I actually wore it as my theme shirt to some Halloween events uh, recently. I know it's like mid-November right now when you hear this, but... Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So this is a Halloween launch, but we forgot to mention it till after Halloween. So that's pretty on brand for us, I would say. Um, so if you're but, still feeling in the in the creepy mood, um, yeah, before uh, you want to know how stupid I am before we record, I said, Eva, will this if if I mention it on this episode, will it it won't get there in time for Halloween, right? And then I'm like, Eva's like, um, it comes out November 11th, and I was like, <laughs> or whatever date, and I was like, okay, by next Halloween it should get to you. So I like if you how you were, look at it. <laughs> I like you were like. Uh, will this get to them before Halloween when we recorded our Halloween episode like weeks ago? Like, weeks ago. <laughs> like on what uh, planet am I talking? I have no idea. But we there's a, a goose cam that Kirky from Workies who did our logo uh, designed this goose cam poster in like two different color schemes. Um, and it's like a crew neck sw baggy sweatshirt. It's my favorite thing. And it says like instead of like R.L. Stein, it says E.M. Christine. And it's mm -hmm. like a goose cam, like kind of a it looks like a like the bird like a hitchcock poster sort of um, yeah it's like a like the cover of a goosebumps book yeah yes the cover of a goosebumps book that's the right way to put it and it's like in 90s retro color um it's really nice so anyway i just want to mention our merch since we don't give it many shout outs uh but go to atwwdmerch.com uh anyway how are you <laughs> I feel like you really dodged the how are you question, but um, <laughs> I, I'm good at that unless um, you call me out on it. And then suddenly everyone how, knows. How was your um, anniversary that happened recently? Oh, it was great. Thank you for all the, the tips. Um, I texted M or I talked to M the day before and I, or two days before. And I said, ah, I'm panicking. I don't know what to do for my anniversary. It's on Friday the 13th. And I wanted to do something scary. Uh, and so M sent me some ideas and we ended up going, a lot of them were sold out because it was, I was so late on everything, but I was ended mm. up doing a, um, booking a, a haunted downtown Cincinnati tour that I'd never done. And we got to go into an old children's theater and use Ooh. EMF readers and like, you know, talk to the spirits there. Did um, you, when they, when they gave you the EMF detector, were you like... I've been there. I've I was this. like, no, I went like this. Oh, cool. It has <laughs> lights. And Blaze was like, stop pretend, stop being, you're making it weird. Um, <laughs> Blaze was he, like, you, you <laughs> probably own one of these. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I, why are you acting? I don't know. I wanted to be like, there were only four people total on the tour and the other two were really quiet. So I felt like I had to kind of, which nobody asked me to, but I felt like I had to overcompensate for Something. quietness. Yeah, I don't know. 
Um, but it was fun. I uh, thank you for sending me all those tips, those links and ideas. You're welcome. I'm glad they were not used, but I, I appreciate they were. one of the ones you sent. I oh. uh, that's where I booked it. Yeah, I see. I see. I see. Well, I'm glad that it worked out. I um, I there's nothing I love more than planning a date. So I know I was like, why haven't I utilized your services sooner? Ah, I would love to just be someone. I don't know what the. I don't think the job exists, but if I could be someone that just plans dates for people, um, that, I think you could probably make that a thing. That'd be a great job. I, I would love pay it so for much. that. I mean, I wouldn't pay for it because you let me do it for free, but uh, <laughs> I think other well, people would pay for it. <laughs> I would love it, especially because I, I, not that I think I've got like the lowdown on like all the cool <laughs> spots, but I definitely have the lowdown on all the weird spots. So like, yeah, if you, you know want a weird date, stuff that like I feel like you know that you can find the stuff that's not just like googling things in blank city today you know what i mean like you you can do the deeper dive and really parse through yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, like options. a travel agent but a date agent yeah. or something but a date yeah. agent that sounds that's, so cool too that's me i'm a um, date agent anyway that's you know in a in a world nearby that's probably my gig and i'm it, really yeah. appreciating the praise so i feel like that's a pretty on on point uh role for you to play so thank you good job um what was i gonna say to you what was i gonna say to I you no I, oh, I miss you though i miss you i am having some um burping issues today cool um, so if I you see me you running anymore. away never mind <laughs> if you see me running away from the microphone that's why because um i discovered a cheese that i like shut the fuck up and I ate a lot of it, and my body's I, reacting. We buried the lead on this one. What? Tell me everything. For Allison's one of her birthdays, because she's getting two this year. Um, long uh -huh, story. Uh -huh. but, We've talked uh, about it on the show. Okay, Don't worry. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so for her first birthday, I a lot of things happened, but I I also made her like um like a Halloween themed charcuterie board. Cute. And. I bought a lot of cheese, man, and I was like, I guess I'm gonna have to help her eat this, so I might as well like try try each of them. Yeah, charbuterie, mm -hmm. and um, I f it was a, I think it was like it was it had to be like the most boring cheese for me to actually like it because I, I feel don't like find I don't... any cheese boring. So um, oh you know, okay, it'll tell um, me it, more. I think it was a Havarti. Yeah, that's classic. That was my favorite as a kid. That was I always okay. Ate that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's yeah, like it's it kind was of like a, a entry level cheese. Yeah, I, I creamy, think that's it's mild. Yes, I cream. It was very creamy. I was like, oh, I feel like this is like coating my mouth. I don't know how I feel about this, <laughs> but it was um when paired with salami, it was pretty damn good. So um, I gotta say that is a classic, and I approve. Okay, good, and I because I really I think. I don't know if I'll ever go further than entry level cheese. I think that's like, fine. Listen, I didn't think you would even get there, so I'm thrilled for you right now. Em, by uh, the way, if you're like, "What the fuck is going on?" Em's not like into cheese, which I know is shocking and jarring. I can't and I stand giving you a trigger warning, but Em doesn't like cheese. He just doesn't like it. I don't know what to but, tell you. Between the two of us, we make a great charcuterie board because I love the meats and you love yeah, the cheese. Yeah, Em eats the cold cuts. I eat the cheese. Eva just is like, "Can you guys get on stage? Because the show's about to start." And we're like. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're yeah. busy. <laughs> Up until this weekend, the only cheese I'll eat is mozzarella, which is also very kind of bland yes. compared to others. So, um, so now very I've melty. got two in the arsenal. Okay. Well, listen, that is uh, a win in my book. So I'm very proud of you. Thank you. Well, my body's reacting because I've never had this much cheese in my entire Oh, life, right. So. Also, you're lactose intolerant. I forgot to mention that. I ate like a whole block by myself or something. <laughs> so I'm really going cool. through it today. <laughs> Ah, with that, Christine, I have a story for you that I, uh, we don't get a lot of these these days. And when we stumble upon one, I'm very excited. And <gasps> because it's so good, I'm scared we've done it before. But I, oh, fun. I, don't... I love these. <laughs> <laughs> Your anxiety, I... like, sprinkles a little more excitement into the episode. Um, it's, it's a mystery for the ages. I feel like maybe someone... If I have covered it, maybe someone's recently listened to the episode and you can call me out. But this does this feels like new information to me. So <laughs> maybe it'll feel like new information to other people. Um, this is the Black Monk of Pontefract. 
Oh, I've heard about this from Astonishing Legends years ago, but I don't think you've covered it. I don't think I've covered it either. I, I don't know check. why I would know, because I don't know any better than you do. Um, uh, well, but... <laughs> it, it, no, that does make me feel a little better. I don't um, remember it from our show, but I I have heard of it on um, Astonishing Legends. I've heard about it for a long time. People have been suggesting it for a while, but I, for some reason, it overwhelmed me. I don't know why. I think the name Pontefract. It's really a threw very me intense off. name. Yeah, I feel like that would that would alarm me as well. Also, I think I just heard like the black monk of Pontefract and I thought like, oh, it's just like a shadow figure of a monk and the story won't be very yeah. long. And well, so to be I honest, just... I don't even remember what it is. So to me, I'm like, is it just a shadow? Fi I don't remember. I feel like there's again, we've talked about this before, but so many stories where it's just like a shadow people are seeing and that's it. And I'm like, oh, the content, I don't know if it'd be that great. But right, right. So I kind of pushed this one away for a while. But man, I see why everyone was telling me to do it so Ooh, okay i'm ready i'm ready i'm ready all right so this is the black monk of pontefract the <gasps> so pontefract um is oh, an old oh oh wait 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 we gotta do it at the same time okay okay on one go oh, oh you on it. go you oh, on, okay on go <laughs> one two three go beautiful let's crack into it baby okay so um Pontefract, which I I I am saying right according to YouTube. Uh Pontefract is an old town in West Yorkshire, England, and it is Latin for broken bridge. Ooh. It uh fun fact sits on an old Roman road that has time and time again uh unearthed a lot of historical artifacts, mm. including a Roman era chariot. Which... I wanna go metal detecting. <laughs> Which like a whole fucking chariot? Like uh, what? What earthquake Oops. <laughs> brought that up to the surface? Um, they've also found items from the Neolithic and Iron Ages, and Come on. they've just they've discovered that uh, this area is also part of a Neolithic henge. Whoa! Um, there was also what's, what's that? <laughs> like stone henge? I think I don't know. I have no idea what a henge oh. is, but they kept saying henge. Um, oh, okay. I'll just pretend like I know. Um, oh, okay. here. A prehistoric monument consisting of a circle of stone or wooden uprights. Okay. So, yeah. Stonehenge is like a circle of rocks or circle of Circle of rocks. Mm -hmm. Also in this area, there used to be Pontefract Castle, which uh, is now in ruins. But it was at one point one of the most powerful forts in the country and allegedly was built on Anglo-Saxon burial grounds. So... Damn, talk about powerful Ooh, la, la. spiritually. Until the 16th century, there was a medieval priory here where monks lived, um, and then that was later destroyed. But in the 1960s, a house was built here, mm. and it sat where old gallows used to be. Oh, jeez. Mm -hmm. Um, Whoa. sorry, Jesus Lord, what? have mercy. Blaze Jesus is running Christ. The, sorry, Blaze is running the dryer. And the my door just started like vibrating on its hinges and like banging back Girl, and forth. Girl, please, <sighs> please. Oh, it scared, scared me so bad. Okay, honestly, sorry. that was that was Blaze's fault. That I'm wasn't so you. sorry. I'm taking he, it out like, on the wrong person. No, but he knows better at this point. Like every time I record, he runs the damn dryer. It's like some weird prank of his. How I guess silly. it works. I really thought a ghost was here. By the way, have you seen any more ghosts since you've discovered all those old haunted no. pictures? No, okay, but I, I just have gotten more attached to them ever since I brought them to, to you. Ugh, that <laughs> is, ter is terrifying. I feel like it's working. Um, <laughs> I think it's working. Oh, God. Uh, okay, so a house was built here in the 1960s. Um, it sounds like this house might have been sectioned into apartments. Maybe it was one whole house at the time and then was later sectioned into yeah, apartments. Yeah, that's what happened to my house. Yeah. So I don't I don't know if it was apartments yet. It sounds like it was just the one family living here right now. But a house was built there in the 60s and Jean and Joe Pritchard move in with their kids. Mm. Uh, they have a 15 year old and a 12 year old named Philip and Diane. Cute. I feel like Diane is such a specific era name. It is. I always think that about that name and like Sherry or there's a few names where I'm like they are so in there 
decade. Like if you met someone with that name, you know when they were born. You know. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know what's really tricking me is all these people with fucking babies with old names. That's really throwing me. Cause it, now I, I effing love it. It's my favorite thing to see I babies can't called stand like it. I don't know. You can't stand it. I love it. I can't stand it. I don't I don't like the <laughs> old names for new babies trend. I Oh, I love it. I know, I know, but we have different tastes on everything. But that's it, true. Like, but I feel like at one point you I don't could... like cheese, and I feel like I automatically win this argument. Sorry, that was fair. I feel like if I heard the name Beatrice up until yesterday, I knew exactly when you were born. Now it you could were born be any fucking ago. day. <laughs> yeah, you're Gen Alpha. Uh, but but think about it. B, what a cute little nickname. Nah, I. Love it. If you named your child Beatrice and you're like about to cry, I'm all over it. I love it. I think you did a great job naming Look, your child. Because if somebody fair, were on a show and said Leona, bleh, I'd probably burst into tears. No, it's not anyone else. It's fully me because I have a five year old's taste in everything. Like I like I like, like you want to name your names. child Megan secretly and you're just not admitting it. Like that's how that's basic not true, M is. but you're on the right path. Yeah, like, I, I, would, I, would well, I was going to say name. other names and then I was like, now I'm going to insult everyone else out there. So I'm keeping no, my I mouth would, shut and sticking with Megan. If I ever had a kid, the name will be like incredibly boring compared to like people at least trying to keep up with trends, you know? I so guess it depends I, on if you're parenting with someone else, because I don't know if you win that argument, you know? Allison and I seem to agree on names. At least we okay. both like boring names. But that's also assuming we'll have children, and that's still up in the air. So I was gonna you know. say, yeah, I said I said with someone else. I listen. I'm I'm not making any judgment calls here. I think you should name your child Megan with six H's if you really want to, and I think we'll all support you, even though we won't approve. Oh, that's fine. You know what I think is the ugliest name I've ever heard in my life? Say it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I do. You know what, Em? I do. Sorry. But why don't you announce it to everyone? Christine. You know <laughs> oh, what? <good. laughs> now that the joke's over. Okay. I'm um, going to name your child Chauncey Bliss, and you're going to have to deal with it. No, I think, um, hmm, should I say it? Maybe we would name him Bartholomew Zachary? Crispin. Bartholomew Crispin! <laughs> That's an inside joke that nobody is aware of yet, but... Um, You'll get aware of it eventually, I promise. You'll get aware and of it. And that is a good call. Even Eva's like, what the fuck are they talking about? Even that, Eva doesn't know what we're talking deep about. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> Bartholomew Crispin. Um, if you would like, how about you all comment what you think Bartholomew Crispin is, <laughs> and you'll all be wrong. Um, <laughs> you'll never guess. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> it would have to be Bartholomew Crispin Jr., wouldn't it? Gross. <laughs> vomitous okay Party. sorry sorry everyone feels like the third wheel right now not knowing I'm what's so going sorry. on i'm sorry i'm sorry eva and everyone else okay anyway it's better than me like just yelling at all the beatrices who are listening in right now but, I, it um, is i'm not gonna lie it's better than that you're right to be fair i was uh, not even to be fair but fun fact i was supposed to have an old lady name i was what was your name then, supposed to be my name was supposed to be esther Okay, I love that name. <laughs> I'm sure you do, but I'm thinking like, oh, I'm really glad I wasn't named that. So my mom went with a different E name, but I yeah. was what named. Is, okay, S what would your nickname be if you, you know, if that had uh, been your My middle name. name. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, your middle name is not going to work either for the yeah. for purposes of. I, I hmm. think it, I, I have no idea. I would have gone with a completely different Terry. name. S -ter 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 Terry. S-ter-ter. No. <laughs> I call you turd. Okay, little turd. Let's keep going. <laughs> no, I don't know. It's just I, I know you would have eaten it up if Esther could have been a name for you. Hilarious. For me, I, I would for love me, I'm it. Glad I, I had a I got a more maybe like modern name. And so I, I appreciate that you as got someone a very who likes modern our names. Generation name for sure. Yeah. My name was the like number one name for like a decade. It was actually it was not original at all. So I don't know what I'm <laughs> into about that, but whatever. Um Yowza, Pontefract Castle. Now it's 1960s. Okay, oh, yeah. so in the nine, yeah, we were told the story. Oh, okay, God. so in the 1960s, a house was built here. Jean and Joe Pritchard move in with Philip, and obviously born in the 50s, Diane. Um, okay, <laughs> so uh, and very quickly, activity in the house began. So in August 1966. The parents and Diane go on a vacation while their son, Philip, stays behind with his grandma. Okay. 
grandma's name is Sarah. To me, that is too modern of a name for a grandma. Um, yeah, that which is, is wild because Sarah is such an old name, but it's I know, continually but it, I becomes. Guess, you know, modern. it was probably a big. It was definitely a big name when we were kids, so it probably seems doesn't fit. Like if your grandma was Megan, you'd be like, huh? Yeah, you know. Yeah, there's some people in like that are our age now, and I'm like, one day you're gonna be like. <laughs> like grandpa dylan what grandpa like it's Chad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> um okay so sarah uh is the name of the grandma so she's staying at the house with philip and now at 11 30 in the morning grandma sarah is inside the house when out of nowhere a gust of wind rattles the windows and slams the door shut oh now would have been the time to turn the dryer on blaze <laughs> I was thinking, I was like, two more minutes, you would have really nailed it. When Philip comes back in from the garden, Grandma Sarah mentions the weather. uh, It's like, oh, wow, the wind is really strong right now. But Philip says, oh, there's no wind outside. What are you talking about? Mm. So these gusts of wind are indoors. Later, Sarah is knitting, and she notices a strange haze is in the house. Hmm. And she notices that it's like a powder floating around her. Oh. And she and Philip look for what it could be. And they assume it must be like plaster crumbling from the ceiling or something. But it's a white cloud that's weirdly staying in the middle of the room. It's not falling and it's not going above their heads. It's just still. Ew. That's a new one. Yeah, I thought so. I was like, oh, something original. (laughs) Um, But the white cloud, so it was weirdly still. And so Grandma Sarah walked across the road to go get her other daughter who lived in the neighborhood. Her name is Aunt Marie. So Grandma Sarah and Aunt Marie are staying with Philip. Okay. She uh, goes to get Aunt Marie. Marie comes over and she actually says that her mom looks like a snowman because she's covered with all this white stuff all over Asbestos, her. Asbestos? <laughs> anthrax? May- Nothing honest- good can come of this. You know, asbestos might have been something they looked into later, yeah. Um, but <sighs> uh, Marie ends up uh, going into the house herself to see why her mom is covered in this stuff when she comes over. Yeah. So she goes into the house and she sees the mist herself and... I guess while they, while Grandma Sarah left, in the time it took Grandma Sarah to leave and come back, the mist had actually fallen, and it looked like there was a white film all over the furniture and even in their tea. Ugh, Ew, disgusting. That's so gross. Next, Aunt Marie walks into the kitchen and slips in a random puddle of water in the middle of the kitchen. Ugh. She cleans it up and she she is still looking at the floor as she cleans this up. Cleans it up and moments later the puddle reforms on its own. Ugh. Hate that. Hate it. Uh then more puddles form throughout the kitchen. So like what like I feel like that's like a really like <laughs> shitty old video game where like you have to clean the puddle and then it grows. It's like yes. it's like whack-a-mole. Yeah, I used um, to play um, fucking Rayman or something. I think it was Rayman or I, no, no, it was a fucking firefighter PlayStation game, and like you would be putting out fires, and it sucked because it's like you always ended up like dying in this fire because you're trying. It instilled oh so much anxiety in me as a child. But anyway, it was basically like, oh, another fire. You got it. Oh, another <laughs> fire. And it was like, man, you're just. I mean, literally putting out fires. Like that's it's kind of like that's it. us the first year of podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no comment, but yes. Uh, So that's what it sounds like. Another puddle to mop up. Um, So assuming that the water was coming from a burst pipe, she Mm. peeled back some of the linoleum, which I love that it's her sister's house and she's just peeling up the floor. (laughs) She's like, what the fuck is wrong with your kitchen? (laughs) So she peels back some of the linoleum to check the floor to see if the water's coming up through there, and it's bone dry. There's nothing there. So the puddle is just appearing for no reason. Mm-mm. Um, another one of their in-laws comes in, uh, Aunt Enid, and <laughs> that's your other I, name. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't hate that name, but I think it's because I just watched uh, Wednesday Adams. Oh, okay. Wednesday, I was like, that's show. really specific for you to have a different opinion about. But okay, it was. I think I had a different opinion at the beginning of that series, and then as I watched it, I was like, oh, this name's grown on me. Ah, uh, yeah, it um, grows on you. So. 
apparently their whole fucking family lives in this neighborhood, by the way. So yeah, what another the another in-law, Aunt Enid, comes over uh, to investigate the puddles with them, but they find nothing. They actually even had someone come out to check the pipes to see if something was happening that they weren't aware of. And the best that like the plumber could come up with was yeah. that this was due to condensation. But like, girl, like, girl, how is... I condensation grade science I know what condensation is the condensation yeah I don't <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> sorry don't be sorry you have nothing to apologize for okay uh yeah I feel like we know enough about condensation to know that it would not just only affect one little area on a floor in be and become a puddle you know instantly yeah um so they were like, okay, even the plumber doesn't know what's going on. Cool. Get him out of here. Great, so great, eventually, great, great. eventually the pools stop forming and both of the ants end up just going home. So now it's back to Grandma Sarah and Philip in the house. But I guess they were like, I don't know. The, the drama's over. So I guess I don't need to be here anymore. Boring. Which is exactly what I would have done. I'd be like, <laughs> call me when something juicy happens. Yeah. Like, you guys want to order pizza? I'm just like, I'm out. It's like the fun's over. I have yeah. to go home now Do to my dry house. Um, <laughs> you can sit in your weird puddle kitchen <laughs> to my non problematic house. Okay, call me <laughs> later that night. Grandma Sarah goes back into the kitchen with Philip, and the they have a tea dispenser, which sounds like a great fucking gift. Um, Us. wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, <laughs> and the tea dispenser, I guess, already had like tea loaded into it. But they go into the kitchen and the button on the tea dispenser keeps pressing itself on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. Ooh. And it keeps pressing over and over until all the tea dispenses all over the counter. So well, annoying. I figured out where your puddles are coming from. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, exactly. the plumber couldn't figure that one out. And as all the tea, once it, once it had been emptied of tea, it still kept pressing on, off, on, off. Ew. Off. Which I guess you could equate in some way to like a malfunction. I, I don't know enough about machines. I don't think that's a good enough reason. But I guess if you wanted to be a skeptic, you could say there was like a faulty wire that was well, making I wonder the button if it, go Well, it was wide. probably not even an elect electric. Oh, yeah. It was, it was in the 60s. Just it was like you make a tea kettle and you have like a spout. Oh, yeah. Okay. Which makes so it kind of creepier because then it's like you have to manually press it. Someone's hand had to be there, yeah. Ugh. Yikes. So, I'm going to get you, um, since you requested it as a gift, a 1960s tea dispenser that you have to manually load and press. Oh, no thank you. Um, <laughs> I'll get you the <laughs> faulty electronic one then. Uh, no, no, no. You can get me a gift card to Starbucks and they can okay, handle all the dispensing. Um, so, yeah, the button keeps going over and over and... Which, like, so inconvenient. It sounds like they were about to get ready for bed, and now they have to clean the entire... It's not even just the counters. It's You know it's seeped under everything. and it never ugh. ends. Never gets ends. behind the on the floor. But ugh. you know me. I went to bed, and you are like, God damn yeah. it, Christine. That's going to leave a stain. I'm like, I don't care. You'd be like, oh, let me go upstairs and find a rag. And you would go upstairs and go to bed. And, and I'm go, standing by TikTok. a pile yeah. of rags. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> you get it. <laughs> I know the second you leave the room, you're not coming back until it's handled. Oh, good. Um, as long as you understand what's happening. That's great. <laughs> as soon as you say, let me jest, I'm already just over it. <laughs> I'll be right back. That's when you know I'll never return. <laughs> You'll see me in a few days. <laughs> like you say, I'll be right back as you bring your phone charger upstairs. As, um, I, as I put on my sleep mask. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> So it keeps pressing down and down, and it just makes a mess everywhere. Then, as they're cleaning this up, they're like, oh, could today get any worse? Yeah. Boom, they hear a big-ass crash. Uh-oh. And it's a potted plant that <laughs> had been thrown up the stairs. Uh, huh? That's That's too much for me because i could have rationalized if it fell down the stairs like totally but even but even then not really because if it's a potted plant that shit's heavy but you could uh, you could rationalize it better up but the being stairs is like really confusing it's really an in it's intentional it's like rationalize this bitch that's what it <laughs> sounds like to me <laughs> you're like this is such a mess and it's like i'll show you a mess yeah, it's like, oh, you don't like the tea all over the counters? Oh. Well, maybe you'll like all the soil on your Some stairs. Earthworms. Okay, there's probably yeah. not earthworms in it, but uh, you never know. 
could be. <laughs> Do you have a plant? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're all dead. I can't figure out why. Um, anyway. It's all the worms in there. <laughs> just keep putting worms in it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they hear his big crash. Potted plant has been thrown upstairs. The pot, by the way, the plant, I guess, fell out on on its travel but the pot itself made it all the way up to the landing which is actually yeah. pretty impressive because i couldn't do that with my own human arms yeah um yeah but the fact that something was strong enough that quickly too to throw That's a whole ass plant up very the unsettling they go back into the kitchen and the cupboards begin rattling so violently that the neighbors reported hearing the noise oh shit and when the activity stopped, they <laughs> went upstairs for bed. That's, um, listen, I get it. At a certain point, you reach like a uh, you're like, cannot compute anymore. I'm tired. I like to think that they were already like so delirious or something. So they could justify like, we must be seeing things. Yeah, like, maybe they, let's check on this again tomorrow and really assess what's going on. Like everything's got a reason. We'll figure it out tomorrow. I get um, it. So they go upstairs to bed. Um, after there's just like dirt everywhere and tea everywhere and the neighbors are calling for noise complaints and they're like, this all will have a reason for sure. <laughs> um, as grandma Sarah is tucking Philip into bed, which love that they're still not even sharing Precious. a room at least. Yeah. Um, as she's tucking him in, his door starts swinging open and <laughs> shut, open and shut, open and shut. Oh No. Thank God she's, she gets some reason to her because then Sarah goes, okay, let's get the fuck out of here. And they okay. run to Aunt Marie's. Phew. Poor Aunt Marie. Her, Aunt Marie's like, oh my God, I already oh left God. you. What? What do you want? <laughs> what, do you, what do you, listen, I'm sorry I'm in a bad mood, but you just made me clean up tea it's for like, two hours. It's like I was cleaning puddles. I mopped your kitchen like 20 times today. What do you and want? And now you want um, tea? Because you're yeah. out of tea. Got it. <laughs> And you want a plant because you're out of worms? Out okay. Of worms. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she calls her husband, Vic, and or her husband, Vic, is there. He calls the police because he's Look. like, obviously, a person has to be in your house. Yeah. Um, and uh, they all go over to the house with three officers to search the house, but they find nothing. Mm. This is what. Sorry, I just burped again. Sorry, the cheese. Excuse me. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we're so professional i'm sorry jack edit that out so vic suggests that they go to the neighbor another fucking neighbor do they all know each other what's going on here um but there's a guy in the neighborhood called mr o'donnell and they're like let's call him because right. he's really into ghosts okay I, I like where Vic's head is. He's like, let's call the police and then get someone with some real information. He's like, we never know. We need a whole team on our side. I feel like Aunt Marie is you and Vic is Blaze. And I feel like Aunt Marie is like, <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but there's like, I, there's puddles and worms everywhere. And like the door keeps opening. And Vic is like, call the police. <laughs> and you're like, oh, that didn't even occur to me. I don't want to bother them though. You know? <laughs> It's so late at night. They might be busy. <laughs> so, okay. So this is where uh, Vic slash Blaze says, let's call Mr. O'Donnell. He'll figure it out. Okay. So they go and knock on Mr. O'Donnell's door in the middle of the night. I can't even imagine what he thought was going on. He's and probably they ready all... to fucking go with his go bag, his ghost go bag, you know, his go. He's like, bag. I've been waiting for this moment my whole life. He's like, finally. And, uh, <laughs> finally some traction in this neighborhood <laughs> so they knock on his door he follows them back to the house and they sit around waiting for something to happen but there's no activity so mr o'donnell gets up to leave and uh because he says that it's very normal for activity to not be reliable um sure. when working with poltergeists and he assumed it was a poltergeist he said, they do funny things. They're very fond of tearing up photographs, I believe. And as he said that, a frame came crashing down off the wall and shattered. You're and the picture, the picture was Joe and Jean's wedding portrait. <gasps> Uh-oh. yike a But I, yeah, he must have felt so validated in that moment. He was like, I fucking told you. Like, it's like wow, I'm nailing this whole thing. <laughs> it's like, this is like my first gig. Like, I'm doing oh a really God. good job. 
So, so now the pictures are falling off the walls. The next day, little Diane and her parents, Joe and Jean, they come home and like, I, can you imagine coming home and finding out that not only did your mother-in-law stay here to watch your son they've been gone this whole time they've been gone this whole goddamn time imagine finding out like oh how was it like did you like fucking play scrabble or something no every single in-law you have and the neighbor and the police have all been here and also there's puddles and tea and you can't even have plants here anymore yeah the tea's broken um the don't go up the stairs you're gonna slip and fall on some worms (laughs) it's a really bad situation yeah, so all of a sudden they're home and they're like, I, I feel like they just are doing like a panoramic view of their home and it's just all a, a <laughs> fucking like a mess. Sitcom. Yeah. They're like, what happened? So they find uh... out what happened and they're saying like, there's been, you know, the windows are rattling, the doors are slamming, we've been hearing knocking and crashes. So Joe, the father, says, what kind of knocks? And at that moment, there were three huge bangs mm. that rattled throughout the house. Oh, boy. And then, coming in with a weird plot twist, nothing happens for the next two years. What? Which, like, talk about, I don't even know what the psychological term is, gaslighting maybe, but, like, yeah. the parents come home, nothing happens. And they're like, like, you guys can tell us if you broke the potted plant. Like, it's fine. And they're like, you don't understand. We Philip- literally didn't. <laughs> Philip and grandma are eyeing each other like, what the fuck? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> I would be like, so pissed off. I would be like, they think that we came up with a fun little story to entertain ourselves while they were gone. Literally, I'd be so pissed. I would be fuming. I, yeah. I'd be fuming. So they have theirs, though, because two years later, Jean is redecorating. Mm. Love that for her. Mm-hmm. And grandma Sarah is over and she starts hearing sounds again oh boy and at this point i feel like gene probably thinks like oh my mom is looney tunes like yeah she... i would be worried it was like oh you now you're hearing things and you were the last one to hear things so <laughs> gene's like okay don't worry about it like it's not true just chill out later gene hears her own sound in the other room oh and She hears the sound. She goes up to see what happened. And as she's going to go upstairs, she sees Philip's blanket that it's usually on his bed sitting at the bottom of the stairs. Okay. That's ominous. It's certainly, I mean, you do have a toddler. I mean, I know he's 15, but I know you probably just see things in places they shouldn't be all the time. It is usually my fault. So like, it's not surprising (laughs) to me when things are out of place, but if it's like, an odd like i can see how that would be like huh it's like that's off-putting right. yeah although you maybe you you christine would have just left your blanket downstairs by accident when you're trying to run away from a situation and it's go to bed for the night entirely possible exactly she sees the blanket downstairs she goes that's uh, weird um she grabs a blanket and goes to put it back uh in in his room And as she's walking away, she hears a louder sound. Uh Uh-oh. She goes to see what happened, and uh, now the blanket is down... Now her blanket is downstairs. And, like, so it was Philip... So, okay, so she heard a sound. Philip's blanket was downstairs. She was like, that's Oh, I see, okay. Grabs it, puts it back on Philip's bed. Walking away, she hears another sound and looks downstairs, and now her blanket is on the floor downstairs. (sighs) Why is it so loud, these blankets? Yeah, I was like, what are these, are these weighted blankets? What's going on? <laughs> they're weighted blankets. I wonder if it's like like a pop, like they're like apparating, like in Harry Potter, you know? Pop, yeah. Pop. Oh, maybe. I don't, know. I don't know what the loud noise is about. Well, also, uh, there not only are her, is her blanket downstairs, but the the louder sound that she did hear was that more potted plants had shattered oh i thought it was the blanket moving got it okay you didn't know i was just gonna let you ride that ride that out i Um, I liked it while i was there so it's okay so yeah now more potted plants are being messed with um later that night gene notices that there is a shadow swaying in the dark ew 
Yeah, like I beg to differ. No, thank no, you. I would. I, beg to differ I would also. about face and get the hell out of there. <laughs> bye, bye, bye. So there's a shadow swaying in the dark, and remember she'd been redecorating. So there's paintbrushes and everything all over the place. She then sees a paintbrush fly past her head as if someone was trying to throw it at her face, hmm. and a bucket slams against the wall behind her. Whoa. She realizes that the swaying shadow is actually a piece of wallpaper, thank God. But Oof. it's not attached to the wall. It's just a random piece of wallpaper floating in the middle of the air by itself. Ew! It's like as if someone's holding it or like something. Like holding it. Ew. As she reaches for it to see what's causing it to float, it drops to the ground by itself. Ugh. Then... The broom in the corner floats into the air and starts moving. Fantasia? What is happening? (laughs) Like, this sounds like Fantasia, which is the scariest movie I've ever seen. You know, if they just looked at it as if it were Fantasia, they probably would have, like, not lost so much sleep. They would have been like, it's just Mickey Mouse. It's fine. It's just Disney World, I guess. Yeah. I I don't know. Suddenly, the broom floats into the air and starts moving all by itself. Jean freaks out and the rest of the family rush into the hall to see what's going on. The noise starts happening uh, now in Diane's room. So it's almost as if it followed her and then went into one of the kids' rooms. They start hearing noises in there. Things are being ripped off the walls. The things that are being ripped off the walls are being thrown out the window by themselves. This thing's pissed off now. Pissed off. And Joe, the father, he slams the door shut and the whole family is just standing in the hallway hearing this going on in (gasps) Diane's room they hear banging in the room they hear just like total chaos and then they hear silence and then knocking on the other side of the door (gasps) (laughs) i hate that so much a knock on the other side of the door i can't think of anything more ominous like like a ghost or an actual person like that like gave me full creeps full goose cam and like then what now do you all go to bed you're like diane have a good night in in your fucking room see ya (laughs) By like, the way, do, do you believe do? me now, Mom? Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so after that day, activity only increased, which I'm not surprised by at all. Yeah. Um, the cupboards and windows keep rattling. There's a constant banging. There's a constant drumming sound. At one point, the china cabinet, like, I guess, falls over. Or no, th- sorry, it doesn't fall over. The china cabinet stands still, but everything sitting in the china cabinet gets pulled out and dropped onto the floor that but, would piss me off and yet nothing broke i feel like oh. that's even eerier though because it's guaranteed to break if it's fine china yeah that's way creepy and it just like bounced off the floor and just sat there yuck a local paper hears about this because the neighbors are constantly complaining about the sounds coming from that house <laughs> oh. and they publish a story on the house and they name the poltergeist Mr. Nobody. Ew! I can't imagine a worse name. That's the worst possible name. Mr. Nobody. The worst name. People start coming to the door to check it out for themselves because they've read this thing in the paper now. And people just want to come in and investigate. They're asking (laughs) for anything they can do to go in and just spend an hour in this house. And the family (laughs) does turn them all away because they don't want to, like, make a whole thing of it. Um. But this is interesting, though, because I feel like a lot of skeptics usually use the theory that, like, oh, well, it's a popular case and, you know, they the family clearly wanted people to come in. They did it for totally. attention or they did it for money or they did it for fame. But this family seemed to have no motive. Um, they also didn't have a motive to even leave the house. Like, the a lot of um, stories, there's... a a lot of haunting cases, there's the theory that like, oh, well, they were having money problems and they couldn't uh, they get out of the lease out. or sure. couldn't leave, get out of the contract. But they had no reason to leave. They liked their house. And then they even were refusing when asked. They would refuse to move um, just because a ghost was there. They were very adamant about staying. Okay. On top of that, they were refusing investigators and reporters and visitors to come in and they wouldn't accept any payment for coverage. So they... We're just riding it out in this house and they were getting fame by accident. Okay. Um, that's a point in their favor, I feel like. 
Yeah, I think so. Because if you want it out, I mean, you're getting the attention. Just go away, you know? Yeah. Like, I, move. Listen, Someone I'm, wants... I'm kind of on their side at this point. Mr. O'Donnell would want to move in, for sure. So. Yeah, he's ready to pay more than you paid for the house. <laughs> So uh, still they had to deal with the normal bullshit that was coming from this ghost. They had drawers and cabinets and their fridge dumping out contents onto the floor every day. Imagine like back in the day, wasn't milk in like a glass bottle? Can you imagine I mean, if it just sh- like now old yes. milk is in your kitchen? Ugh. And I mean, it's just a nightmare. Like I would, if I were the neighbor, I'd be like, I'm never going back over there. Or like the aunt would be like, I'm yeah. The- I'm over I'd it. be like, you come to me for dinner. Yeah, yeah. I'm tea not time happens there. at my house now. Yeah, where I actually have teacups that I don't have to worry about flying across the room. <laughs> so they're dealing with like the constant mess, the constant puddles, the lights are turning on and off every second. Eventually they tape the switches and the lights still go on and off all the time. Oh, God. The family thought about going like to a church for help, but their reverend said that exorcisms... Uh, often made poltergeist cases worse and the bishop would probably not approve which like maybe he was trying to be a realist there but he really was their only line of defense and he told them not like fat chance pretty much yeah yeah, Um, yeah. and so they got kind of essentially turned away by the church helping them and that's when things get even worse because now heavy heavy furniture is lifting on its own and one time lifted off the ground and landed on Diane, who was coming up the stairs. Oh, no. So the furniture, which also, by the way, if it wasn't heavy enough, it was like apparently this big oak furniture. It also had a really heavy, like old school sewing machine sitting on it. Oh, shit. And they both flew into Diane and while she was coming up the stairs and this was press, was pressing her into the steps. So Philip and their mother tried to pull it off diane but what's really interesting is that when they were trying to pull it off of her they realized she wasn't crying she was crying because she was scared but she wasn't crying because she was in pain because the furniture wasn't crushing her it was just floating against her to hold her down and so they realized that she was totally fine and it was just fucking with them that is so and, sinister and creepy. I mean, like, it, that furniture, and she's a 12-year-old girl on stairs, like, that would have killed her, for sure. Yeah, and, to launch that at a child. And instead, it just wanted to hold her down and freak everyone out. So, like, show off that it could do it if it wanted to, which is so Yeah, all up. it would take is me dropping this, you know? <sighs> when they finally got it off of her, Diane obviously struggled through the night um (laughs) but even more so because this girl by the way i don't know if it's like the parenting and we're all trying to act like everything's fine or if diane was totally chill with this i don't know what the vibe was but this girl's still going to bed in her own fucking bed like poor child (laughs) it's trauma when her her room has been completely tarnished by this thing furniture is being thrown at her like like uh, like pinpoint at her like she's the target I feel like as a parent, she shouldn't be left unattended at this point. I would say um, probably not. Like, I don't think as a parent I could sleep knowing she's in the other room. Like, oh, is right. another dresser on her again? <laughs> well, as she was sleeping that night, she got flipped out of her own bed four times. Of course. And every time the mattress would land on her. Oh, God. Um, so she'd get <laughs> pushed really out. effed up. I guess it's like someone would like lift the mattress until she rolled off and then would keep pushing the mattress until it landed on her. Um, this and Mr. Nobody continued to break furniture. He would fill rooms with perfume smells and he began to make items vanish and rematerialize. Um, okay. It started like apparent, that. you know, I like that. Well, I don't know about this because the thing he really liked to make disappear and then reappear were eggs from <laughs> closed <laughs> cartons. <laughs> he like, okay, that without- happened to me one time pray tell no okay i, I promise i'm not trying what to make it you, about me but one time what are you talking about home from trader joe's and i bought a carton of eggs and i put all the groceries in the back seat excuse me and at one point um uh i well, i got home and I, I pulled the groceries out and i realized 
one of the eggs was missing. And I thought, uh-huh. uh-oh, that means it probably rolled somewhere in my car. So I'm like digging through my car. I tear the thing apart. Can't find it. And then I go, well, any day now it's going to start smelling. And uh, it never did. And I never found it. I sold the car. And um, I, everyone's like, well, you probably just bought it that way. But like, I do that thing. Every time I buy eggs, I check the dozen yeah. that they're not cracked. So I was like, I don't know where it went. Could I it just have fallen them. out in the bag? It, well, it wasn't you, in there. You brought all sex in? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, I, I don't know. It was, it's a stupid story, which is why I never told it. But uh, the egg just vanished. And I thought, oh, that egg's going to reappear and like make my car smell terrible. Yeah, but it, it would just, at least smell bad. Speaking I like, of got things inside, that... open the eggs. Eleven. Eleven eggs. Speaking of things that shockingly don't smell that bad, I've, I have might have told this story before, but my um, best friend in college, um, she had an old thing of milk. Did I tell you about milk? I don't. We named so. him Milk. Oh, you um, named the guy milk? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. It was milk, and we just referred to it now as milk. Um, oh, you, we were, oh, I'm sorry. You've given milk a, a, a persona. Yeah, we were lazy gotcha. with the naming, obviously. But we bought a carton of milk, and then it just expired, and then we it, we just kept being too lazy to throw it away. Um, <sighs> and we were like, let's see how bad it can get. Oh, and... Um- and so no wonder you don't like cheese. I mean, this is already a formative experience, it sounds like. So every now and then we would check milk and we'd be like, how's milk doing? And we would just see, we would look through the carton to see if it was getting crazy, but we wouldn't open it because we wanted it to be as potent as possible. And we decided on sick. his, we decided on milk's birthday, aka no. the anniversary of his, his expiration birthday. date. <laughs> um. <laughs> we were like on milk's birthday we'll open him and smell him you sound and... like me right now what are you doing <laughs> what so uh i think we made it past milk's birthday and we still didn't because we were like now we really have to see how long we have to go but my um my best You're friend she sick. she got really um drunk one night and she got really hung over the next day and she couldn't get herself to throw up and i was like i think it's time we like hang out with milk you're so sick and so we opened up milk to you're sicko if it would make her throw up and get this after a year of being completely closed smelled like nothing nothing really nothing isn't that the craziest thing in the whole world smelled like nothing I wonder it if was, it's like because it didn't get oxygen into it. I don't know, but it also—I mean—it was completely separated, so maybe like, oh, maybe it was solidified or something. Ugh. It like totally—I don't—I like it was totally. I mean, it didn't look like milk after That's a year. I'll tell you that. Gnarly. But, um, but we just kept passing it to each other, being like, "It smells like air. It smells like nothing." And it was—it was actually really anticlimactic because we'd waited a whole year. But <laughs> did anyway, you throw milk away milk yeah after a decade now milk is somewhere and it's not in our fridge so. <laughs> milk has <laughs> developed like an entire ecosystem and is like running the t- mayor of the town now i just think it should be studied because like you really would think after a year that thing would smell like like tons of whatever that, i'm impressed i am surprised i'm surprised anyway um <laughs> shout out to milk and wherever uh, you are <laughs> wherever you are whatever dumpster fire you've created for yourself <laughs> mr nobody would make things appear out of nowhere and disappear out of nowhere including eggs from the fridge apparently without even opening the fridge door or opening the carton eggs would disappear from the carton in the fridge and they would be found later dropping out of thin air onto the floor so oh, now cracking and now there's like egg in your carpet and shit okay that would piss me off and like that goes like you know how we always talk about oh i wonder like how these things materialize and disappear like that adds to the equation because it's like okay it's just materializing in thin air like it's not yeah like this thing is getting picked up and moved somewhere and then no it really it goes into the theory that there's another realm that it's being transferred or something yeah 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 and I love that that's kind of like a um, modernized twist on like the demonic presence where it's like, oh, I can't, I'm not going to s- just like biblically accurately smell like sulfur, but I will break eggs in your carpet. So over time it smells like <laughs> sulfur. So that you know? your vacuum cleaner <laughs> stinks like sulfur forever. <laughs> so um, 
Jean eventually runs into a friend who has some psychic tendencies named Renee. Um, and she comes over to the house to help them out a little bit. And all the only note we have about Renee is that when she was over there, uh, somehow either she brought one with her or it was made for her when she got there. But Renee has a sandwich. Um, and <laughs> of course, while she's there, the lights go out. And when they come back on, a bite mark is mysteriously <laughs> in Renee's sandwich. And then um, grandma's like, I don't know. I don't, that's the kind of thing that happens here. <laughs> Sorry. And then Renee takes the sandwich and goes home. Um, she's like, so, not for you. With a potential demonic bite mark in it, or just grandma's teeth. Um, <laughs> whatever it is, she still plans on finishing the sandwich when I she mean, gets it's home. It's a perfectly good sandwich. Uh, yeah, you just cut around the demon spit. Yeah, exactly. That's all. Um, so anyway, that's the only note we have about Renee is that she appeared, she a bite of her sandwich is missing, and then she left. I love this um, for her. So then Joe, his uh his sister comes over, another in law in the neighborhood. She's a, her name's Maud, and she's a skeptic. A lot of the family seem to be skeptics, but Maud is serious about this. She's like, I'm going to come over and debunk this once and for all. I'm so fucking tired of hearing about this thing. Like, let's yeah. just, let's just figure this out. Okay, Maud, let's see what you got. Well, Maud has a, a bit of a roller coaster because <laughs> she, uh, she gets over there. The lights start flickering by themselves. And when they come back on, everything in the fridge has been thrown across the room. Later that night, her fur gloves. Oh my god! Now we know what type of person Maud is. Um, her name's her, Maud. She can't help it. Em. I know. Uh, her fur gloves go missing, and she blames the kids. That's her skeptical thought. She's, She's like, "Oh, seems like really rude." She doesn't sound like the fun aunt, you know. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Um, she sounds like the one who like buys you like socks for Christmas, fur luggage. Gloves. Yeah, for She's gloves. like, here, you could have your own for gloves. I know how much you love mine. It's like, um, thanks. <laughs> like, girl, we didn't want these. Mm -mm. Um, so she thinks that the kids are throwing food out of the fridge. She thinks that they stole her for gloves. But later, they appear, she finds them again in the middle of the night in a doorway. And yeah. it, thank you, but it's going to get worse because... When she found them in the doorway, they weren't just lying on the floor in the doorway. One glove was gripping the top of the door frame. No. By itself. And the other one was gripping the bottom of the door. <coughs> as if something with a six foot wingspan was wearing them and holding the door. Like kind of sideways, like. Yeah. Peering or, out. I'm or gonna thro throw it. Or on both oh, sides. Or like this. Like could peeking. be holding both sides and peeking over. Because I feel like that's a big shadow shadow person thing that people see them like peek around doorways. Yeah. You know? that seems but to one be a... glove was at the top of the frame, the door frame, and the other was at the bottom. <laughs> this is so like, like a it sitcom had to be <laughs> where like somebody says, oh, XYZ is missing. And they're like, oh, I haven't seen it. And then they show up like wearing it. And you're like, it's yeah. my fucking coat. <laughs> like the guy's like, I haven't seen your gloves. I'm sorry. It's like. I, I can I, see them on your hands. I will say this is the first demon I've ever heard of that really loved a fur glove. Fashion, so yeah. I was like, in my mind, I'm like, you're a demon. Don't you already just naturally have furry gloves on your, like, furry You'd think hands? That'd be part of the deal. Yeah. But hey, this one loves fashion. So accessorizing. It's okay. Work it, girl. Yeah. Um, so remember, Maud is a skeptic. <laughs> How could I forget? <laughs> but then Maud sees this happen and she turns into M. Schultz because she starts singing a Christian song. <laughs> <laughs> Our God is an awesome God. <laughs> um, which I don't blame her, girl. I would be Lord's Prayer. You, I know. Everything. I would, like, whatever it takes to get those creepy little gloves away from me. All of a sudden, I'd never want the gloves again. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, forget it, forget it, forget it. So she starts singing a Christian song and one of the gloves s comes off of the door frame, floats in midair and starts moving as if it's conducting her singing mockingly. Ew! ew, 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 ew. Then light bulbs in the room 
I guess, come off of their fixtures and begin floating in midair while the glove is moving. <laughs> it's like a candlelit uh, sonata <laughs> happening here. This is quite a portrait we're painting. Then the bulbs and the gloves all vanish out of nowhere. So she's missing her fucking gloves again. So all done. Yeah. Bye-bye. Around this time, uh, Jean, the wife, she names the poltergeist Fred, which I love that she said Mr. Nobody is not enough. So It's not happening. Gonna... I'm sorry. The children are scared. His name's Fred now. Also, quick question. Sorry to interrupt, but was that happening at Maud's house? So like she went she, home she, and saw this? She, no, she stayed the night. Um, oh, to, oh, so it was still to, in their house. Yeah, she stayed the night to try to debunk whatever was going on. And Great, okay. I like that this thing was like, have you figured it out yet? Yeah, um, uh, it's not the kids. It like wanted the credit, but it was like, but you still can't have your gloves back. It's like, I'm Sorry. taking those and the light bulbs, bitch. <laughs> <Yeah>. like- <laughs> <laughs> nice try, Maud. So, uh, <laughs> Gene nicknames the poltergeist Fred, even though he already had a nickname, but whatever. Um, and they can often now Maybe feel it's him. Maybe Fred ar- Nobody. Maybe Mr. That's his first Frederick name. Nobody. Mr. Frederick Nobody. Does that make sense? Just saying. He starts just giving off bad vibes without doing anything. So, like, even without activity around, they can sense him. And yeah. they say before he does something, they all feel an icy chill in the air. Um, but- Aunt Marie from across the street and her husband, Vic... They consult another priest for the family, um, and this priest says that an exorcism would be ineffective at this point, but they Uh suggest, which, like, ineffective at this point, does that mean any other exorcism story we've heard was a lighter case than this? Exactly. And also, like, you were the ones who said, oh, sorry, we can't help you. And then later you're like, oh, sorry, it's too late now. It's like, well, you're the one who rejected us the first time. I feel like this priest just didn't want to have to deal with it. I feel like he was like, right off. That sounds like a lot of work, so no. So I'm really busy. He suggests... I am really busy. Yeah, I have to go wash my hair that day. Um, <laughs> that, to be fair, that's a problem. He, he um, suggested, like, oh, an exorcism wouldn't work, but if you wanted to try something, I guess you could try holy water and praying. I'd be like, um, excuse me, Mr. <laughs> Priest, but how about I suggest you try holy water and praying yeah. during an exorcism? How about Come that? on over. Uh, so Vic, Uncle Vic comes over and he does this. He's fucking doing the priest's job. So he starts sprinkling holy water everywhere Classic. and saying prayers. And once he used the holy water, they hear banging and wa- they see water trickling down the walls as if uh, the house is uh, rejecting the blessing. Yeah. Then, so they hear banging, water is coming out of the house. And then a crucifix falls off the wall. And throws itself at Diane. This poor little girl. She cannot get enough. This child. It's so sad. Crucifix gets thrown at Diane. And I don't know what Hollywood movie trick this is, but the crucifix that got thrown at her sticks to her back <gasps> and won't come off of her. Okay. It took poor a child. It took a while for the family to completely get it off of her like they had to rip it off of her and it left a big red mark on Diane for days that is so sad soon pictures of Jesus himself start falling off the walls and (sighs) when they woke up the next morning upside down crosses were painted on all the doors ew sorry that was really loud uh I in those moments I'm sure that was very terrifying but I also want to know like what shade did he pick you know yeah yeah yeah. it was probably the shade she was like fucking painting the wall like the Oh, like using paint that was nearby. That's that's yeah, smart. I, I was know. thinking, like, did he just like go through the Pantone, like, it's just like little... an ombre cross? <laughs> <laughs> um, lights continue to flash on and off on their own, and items continue to weirdly disappear and reappear. One example is a coat that they found uh, that had gone missing. A fur they found it. Coat. I don't know about fur, but it would it would add to the ensemble, wouldn't it? Imagine that showing up in the doorway. You're like, wow, the out- transformation's complete. <laughs> All we need now are some flashy boots and we'll get yes! walking. <laughs> um so one of the families one of the family members' coats went missing and they found it in a shed under a pile of coal. Ew. And when they pulled it out, I don't know how this works, but when they pulled it out, it was completely clean as if there was no coal or dust or anything on it. Ugh, what does in it my even mind, mean? 
clean. Yeah, I'm like, does that mean it looked clean under the pile of coal or did it look fucked up and somewhere between you grabbing it and right. pulling it on its own, it did a transformation? I don't know. That is um, so bizarre. Another example is that when Jean was cleaning out the chimney one day, 19 keys fell out of the chimney of the <laughs> fireplace. And she put together all 19 keys and realized that 18 of them were her own keys that they'd lost throughout the house. No. And a 19th was a strange old key she'd never seen. This is so effing creepy. Shortly after, Fred starts physically appearing before the family. Honestly, Uh-oh. finally. because like, Finally, it's... show yourself. First, he shows up in a doorway and he looks like a monk in a black hooded robe hence the black <sighs> monk of pontefract makes sense when it appeared uh oh, oh sorry then it appeared at a neighbor's house which i you know that neighbor was the one that was complaining the most about noise oh you, he's like i'm finally here to address like, complaints it's, yeah exactly look me in the eyes and tell me i'm too loud um again he was described as a monk in a black habit then Renee, sandwich girl, um, <laughs> she comes over to Jean's house and she sees it after the lights turn out by themselves. The lights are out and she now sees this thing. She says it was floating in a black robe. Gross. Okay. So it's it's presenting the same to these multiple people. Yes. Then the kids see it while watching TV and it appeared on the other side of the kitchen door. And when they went to go look, it sank into the floor and vanished. Gross. Soon after this, it grabs Diane by her throat. My God. And drags her up the stairs. <gasps> Which, like, I wonder if it's, I wonder what that means. Because it, when it was, I'm assuming weeks ago at this point, when it was throwing huge furniture and almost letting it land on her just to freak everyone out, yeah, he, it clearly had the potential to hurt her then and didn't. So, like, why is it now grabbing her by the throat and dragging her? Maybe it had to, excuse me, this is, like, just me talking at my ass, but maybe it had to, like, develop enough power to actually harm someone or physically harm. I don't know. I don't know. Or maybe it's I just, was, like, I, was I feel like say, it's maybe, such a ghost thing to like have an object whiz past you and like hit the wall or like and so my my thought has always been is there like some law of nature like some invisible law we don't know where like they can't actually hurt us mm. i don't know but I, obviously now it is so i, I have no or idea. maybe maybe it just likes the long con and was like i just want you to i just want to mentally torture you first that's true you know? like that's still i mean it sounds like an abuse tactic like oh i could hurt you if i wanted to and then like months years later be like okay now's the time I'm yeah, it's like gradually yeah 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 well, so now it's grabbing her by the throat, dragging her up the stairs. Later, she had red finger marks on her from that. But she's getting dragged up the stairs and Philip and her, their mom mm. grab her. And when Philip tried to grab the, at the ghost or grab at whatever was holding her, the entity let go of Diane. And it made all of them fall down the stairs. Um, oh, gosh. It was kind of like uh, when you're playing tug of war and one person yeah. lets go. So the other person goes backwards. That's that evil happened. trick that I always do. And nobody likes it yeah <laughs> i'm sure zandy loved it growing up yeah i'm sure i'm sure he's not traumatized at all one morning uh they wake up and the hall carpet is soaked through with water and also covered in hoof prints <laughs> no then whatever is in this house starts mimicking animals and they start <laughs> hearing cow and chicken noises throughout the house and more eggs start dropping out of thin air but now, instead of smelling like eggs, it smells like perfume. Oh, God. Oh, weird. When a visitor mentioned the family's clock, it shattered immediately. I, like, I mean, <laughs> don't things are just... comment on anything. It's just don't, don't talk about the kids. Um, but, don't uh, talk about the house. And yet the family just kept living life amongst this poltergeist and i mean like i don't know why after all this stuff they haven't moved this thing is grabbing your kids like yeah that's what i worry about this poor child well one day joe's friend who had just come back from scotland said that oh you know i, I heard over there in scotland one of the things that they do is they hang garlic over doors and windows 
and that mm. like protects them from spirits. So not to make this super abrupt, but the family tries that and it works. And oh. there's no more activity in the home after that. It okay. was okay. All easy. they had to do that entire fucking time was hang garlic up. They must be so pissed off. Like, really? Couldn't you have told us this three years ago? They're like, we had garlic on the counter and in the fridge this entire time. He was throwing it around. We could have just hung it up. Yeah. But this poor child is like probably never going to eat garlic again. She's like, I can't eat garlic. It's a long story. <laughs> yeah. I So a, lo- a lot of people do actually think that um, the garlic being hung isn't actually what ended the spirit. They think like it just aligned perfectly. Like it's coincidental oh. that like the poltergeist just kind of ended activity at the same time they hung it up. Right. Um, or they think like, Hey, maybe the poltergeist like finally got it in some way that like we're rejecting you go away. They don't really know. It's just like, it could be a total coincidence, but Weird. it's just so odd. Um, in the 1980s, an author named Colin Wilson interviewed the family. Uh, and he was surprised at how normal the entity had become in their lives because when he was asking them questions, they didn't even seem traumatized. They talked about it like a cousin who was living there. Like they were just like, oh, oh and then, like an what old happened? roommate. Ugh. Yeah. Um, Diane, the little girl, even later said that, yeah, it terrorized her, but she never sensed any true harm. And part of me is like, huh? Oh. Like it was. It threw furniture on you. It flipped you out of bed. It grabbed you by the throat. It was flinging you around. I, I think sense you're, harm. I'm like, I sense. You're allowed to sense harm. It's okay. I wonder if it's, like, just a, a coping mechanism at I this know. point. I like, Poor thing. Um, one guy named Tom Cuniff, uh, he heard about the poltergeist and looked into the priory that used to be there, thinking that that might have some history to it, but they, no one found anything. Reporters didn't find anything. This, at this point, they think that the spirit could be from any time period because remember that town is literally ancient and full right. of burial sites. It could be from any time. Um, and maybe because of that, another theory is that the land itself is so powerful, it allowed the spirit to start out mm. that strong. Um, they think maybe the location alone, because of its history, gave the spirit some sort of power to draw from. And then the classic theory is that the spirit was drawing power from the kids, which is why it was going after Diane so much. Mm-hmm. Um, and anyways, this house is called a lot of times the Amityville of the UK, which oh is somewhat gosh. it's somewhat ironic because a lot of people think that the story has a lot more authenticity than Amityville does. So mm. um but there's a director named Bill Bungay who made a movie about the house. And when he found out that the house was for sale, so I guess they finally left, he found out the house was for sale. He bought it and used it for the movie's premiere. So No way. Like, how wild is that that you could watch a movie about a house in the house? I would be delighted and terrified. I'd go for sure. I'd go, <laughs> I'd go for too. sure. I'd, I'd go be too. fucking wearing necklaces of garlic, but I'd go. <laughs> I would um, be eating just cloves of garlic, but yeah. <laughs> After buying the house, visitors were talking about the poltergeist a lot, especially in the house. The movie was playing, and I guess because the poltergeist was getting some sort of attention, activity started happening again in oh, the house. Oh, boy. Um, and I don't know more details on that, but the director ended up writing his own experience about the house um, into his book called The Black Monk Upon a Fract. And the house is now open to visitors and investigators if you are interested in going. So, jeez. Anyway, that is the Black Monk of Pontifer. That is creep. That's one of the creepiest haunting stories I've heard in a long time. I that one I was floored that I hadn't covered it. I would love to go there. <laughs> oh no! I, well. I'm I would go up. with you, but you know where, like, Spongebob, his breath was really bad? That would be me with garlic. I'd have yeah, to... Yeah, me too. Don't worry. I, I'd i just be seeping bad fumes if I ever went into that house because I'd like be so scared. I would be like Patrick where I don't have a nose because it won't phase me in the slightest, <laughs> you know? I'll just stand there and be like, what's everyone so concerned about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, I would go. I would go. Okay, good to know. I will follow you in, and I will be the first one out. So I just love that. I'll... Em's just going to follow me in there, because I was like, well, why I resist wonder if, at this point? I wonder if any of... So, like, uh, in nearby, like, within 15 minutes of me, is Marty McFly's house from Back to the Future. Oh, yeah. And 
the original family doesn't live there anymore, but the original neighbors still live there. Oh. And if you go over there and take pictures of the house, the neighbors sometimes will come out and tell you stories about when they Fun. were filming there. I wonder if like all the fucking in-laws, someone still has to live in that neighborhood. Maud. Maud's got to be there or like Uncle Vic or Mr. O'Donnell. Someone, Grandma Sarah? Oh no, she might not be with us anymore. Uh. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, Someone from that neighborhood still could be there. I would like to go talk to them and be like, how fucking loud was it from your house? Tell us like, all the gossip. Do you have you an know? old copy of that newspaper where it got, it got mm. its name, Mr. Nobody? Like, I want to know Ooh. the dirt from someone who was there, you know? Hell yes. I mean, I'm looking right now at uh this page and I would really like to go. What page? Sorry, the page for the house. Mm. It's uh, 30 East Drive dot com. Three zero East Drive dot com. Um, it's got its own th- website. That's so badass. Oh, hell yeah. And the visitors comments. Here's a handwritten one. It was a terrifying experience. This place is one, if not one of, if not the most haunted house in the world. All my love. <laughs> Uh, all my Yvette. love all my love Yvette kiss kiss Yvette, I have a feeling Yvette's never coming back um, kiss kiss never see kiss, you again kiss. bizu bizu um <laughs> 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 but um i i definitely um you know if all the poltergeist wanted was some attention i guess he's getting it now right so yeah i mean it sounds like he's finally like thriving um so congratulations to everybody um thank you I uh, you're welcome. Yeah. I uh I don't know. I want to go. It sounds like something I would I would like to do. So Eva, Eva? escort uh Christine <laughs> to the Black Monk of Pontefract. I'll be here. Don't worry Ben's about it. Not attending. I'll check out the emails. I'll I'll cover the emails for you guys. Have fun. I'll I'll write. I'll write. Bizu bizu. I'll yeah bizu bizu. I'll write and uh I'll sign your name in the guest book. M just in case. Okay. I am going to tell you a story today. This is the story of the George brothers and uh, it's a doozy. So we're going to hop right into it. I love when we have a double doozy episode. Okay. It's a double doozy and these are two twins. So it's a (gasps) double, double doozy. It's a quadruplet doozy. Oh my goodness. Uh Oh, quadruple doozy. Uh Uh-oh. Twin brothers, Chris and Jeff were born in 1980 to parents Denise and John Paul George. The two boys grew up in Wellington, Florida. Have you heard of this town? <laughs> no. Why should I have? Well, I don't know. Because apparently it's like really up, like this fancy ass town, very upscale. Um, it's where attract- Yvette lives. <laughs> For sure, no doubt. Um, I love that you thought that I might know about it, but well, um, I know I said that because well, I said that because I think you're very fancy, obviously. But thank you. I also said that because it's known for people like former Prince Harry, uh, who spent time there and mm. uh, played competed in polo there. So I I didn't know if this was something people knew about, and I was just you know the odd one out. But uh, I'm. I'm I'm with you. I don't know. You're with me. Okay, great. So it's an upscale community. It's known for its horses and polo, and it attracts billionaires like Bill Gates, celebrities, even royalty, like I mentioned. And the dad, John Paul George, was enjoying massive success as a home builder in Florida. And he wanted like these just I mean, he they built he built like these massive McMansions, you know. And so he wanted his family to have a luxurious life, and that was his goal. So Chris and Jeff, the twin boys, they grew up with everything they could have ever wanted. Toys, ATVs, like any anything that fancy, struck their fancy, uh, their parents would buy for them. They were athletes and scholars who grew up competing in everything from tennis and hockey to mathematics competitions. And they had this kind of uh, relationship with each other um, that their stepdad would later call a love-hate relationship. It was like they were always competing, but then they like had each other's backs if something went mm. wrong, if that makes sense. Like, like they, it was like a like a, a charming rivalry. Um, except not no? so charming, but, oh. but yeah, yeah. A rivalry. A rivalry. A rivalry that. <laughs> frenemies. It was sort yeah, frenemies, if frenemies, that's probably the best way to put it. It was like. Okay. They hated being apart, 
But then when they were together, they were just bitching at each other the whole time or like okay. trying to one up each other. It's like so, you and Zandy. Oh, kind of- it's so annoying to be in a room with the two of you. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's not like it's, that. It's not like that because I think um, I would not participate anymore if that were the case. You know what I mean? <laughs> like if I were dealing with this, I'd be like, okay, you win the fucking competition. I don't care about polo. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So they were very competitive. Um and their parents divorced when they were about eight years old. And Denise remarried a man named Michael Haggerty, a firefighter. And uh, he met the twins when they were nine in 1989 and got the impression that the boys were a little difficult and later commented about their kind of love-hate front of me relationship with one another. They hated being apart, but then, you know, were it's like very toxic. Like they hated being apart, but then when they spent time together, it was just like butting heads the whole time. Like they kind of love the conflict. It sounds yeah, like they kind of. It's like they thrived. I, I wonder. I wonder what what month they were born in because I feel like that might give us a little insight. Um, yeah, can I look it up. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, giving fire energy. I'll tell you that it is giving fire energy. I was going to say Gemini energy, but I think you're more right with the fire. Uh, uh, date of birth. <laughs> What are they Gemini's? <laughs> They're Scorpios. Okay, well, good to know. Eleven, I'm... eleven. They were born. No comment. What are the odds that they're twins born on eleven, eleven? That, that angel feels number. weird. <laughs> feels weird. Yeah, it feels like it could have gone in such a different direction. Um, yeah. Not that you know where we're going, but it's not good, as you can probably guess. Sure. <laughs> so okay, Scorpios. I'm. A little surprised by that but also not okay anyway uh so they, <laughs> they i got started, no comment i've said enough yeah, about scorpios in my life stepped out of the conversation um when they were young they started a brush fire that became a forest fire and took firefighters two days to control and they ended up having to do community service as punishment and it didn't really hit me until right now that their stepdad was a firefighter imagine how pissed off he must have been Oh my god! Like didn't even kids, think about their it. They're teenagers. They started a fucking forest fire. Oh god! Wow. Yeah, I'd be pissed. That's got to be a, a, a high tension household. A- awkward dinner. Awkward dinner. Awkward. Awkward indeed. They started fights in hockey so often that their mom Denise stopped going to games because other parents like couldn't stand them and were so irritated. Mm. She's like, I feel uncomfortable. I'm not going to your games anymore. But Chris and Jeff, this was only the beginning. They got into more legal trouble throughout their teen years. They were arrested several times on charges like theft, vandalism, obstruction of justice. And according to their stepdad, Michael, their father, John Paul, always called his attorney and was always able to pull them out of whatever trouble they'd gotten themselves into. And Mm -hmm. we know how that goes when you have no consequences for any of your actions as a teenager. Yeah. Uh, It goes bad. So they usually only had to do like my minor amounts of community service and never really faced any consequences for their actions. And allegedly their father told them they could do whatever they wanted because they were smarter than the police and everyone else. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) damn. Wow. We are just building ourselves a pair of narcissists, huh? Oh yes. Oh yes. You know what? It's not even framed that way in my notes, but you just hit the nail on the head. Yes. Well, if you're telling them you can have anything you want, except a single consequence, and also you're Except smarter and better than everyone. You're you better are, than the police and everyone else. You are superior in all ways and have all the power to do whatever you want. <laughs> but also, I'm going to kind of rile both of you up and pit you against each other. Just also, to... you're Scorpio, so good fucking luck. Um, good luck. Good luck. Uh, Jeff and Chris, as you basically just said, were really never told no about anything. Uh, Jeff considered himself an entrepreneur. <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, that was fucked up to laugh at. Okay. I'm so interested. Was it? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I know on a, I, I just know on a first date he would be the worst. <laughs> he would I mean it's like I'm an entrepreneur and then like couldn't give you a single piece of information on anything except like Bitcoin. <laughs> it's like, oh I work all right, exactly. Like I work in finance and it's like, no, you like bought Bitcoin last week and you're really proud of it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Calm down. Calm down. But his parents, his dad, I'm sorry, when he was, by the way, his dad, John Paul, was interviewed and was like, these boys. And once you know, like, how far 
this is gone later on. You'll, it, it was like jarring to see the dad be like, oh, these silly kids. And I'm like, um, okay. Oh okay. Guess I can't wait to get angry. Give a shit. But uh, the dad called his sons entrepreneurs, uh, which is f- quite a choice of a word. But anyway, uh, in an interview, Jeff described himself as more of the ideas person, and he considered himself more creative and spontaneous than his brother, Chris, who was more kind of the straight laced, like uh, more cerebral of the two. Mm -hmm. So Jeff opened a business called Shutter King. Wow, he is an entrepreneur. (laughs) Where he would install storm shutters uh, to protect homes during hurricanes um fun fact his shutters didn't work and <laughs> when hurricane francis when hurricane francis hit all of them broke and properties were damaged and uh his business rapidly went under uh in a number of legal settlement settlements but jeff kind of didn't give a shit so he just kind of moved on um because he had a new interest which was treasure ocean treasure hunting um okay. which is an interest I didn't know I had until this very moment. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, it. Uh, on one side, I can see it because I also love geocaching. I get it. Sure. I get it. I get it. But like, <laughs> I, I feel like he really did just decide like, oh, I am a scuba diver and I know exactly what I'm doing. And I'm going to get my own boat just for the fun of it. And then I'll yep. also have someone throw a treasure chest down and then I'll go digging for it. And also, oh, yeah. do- you know what? That's it. It's, it reminds me of like when Royal families way back when would have like people like hold their gun for them. Yes. and Go hunting. And I'm like, is that hunting? Are you really yeah. good at hunting? Or are you I just feel like-, like making people do it for you? Like if you went on an excursion with other people and like you were amongst the people, it'd be one thing, but you know, he made his dad buy him a yacht so he could jump off of it to go diving for treasure. Oh, do you mean his treasure boat that his dad bought him? (laughs) His dad bought, his dad bought him a treasure boat. Was it called Ocean Gate or something? Or what? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, maybe. I mean, the predecessor. What was the, so, okay, so I was totally on point then. So he got his own treasure boat. Yeah, 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 yeah. He got, uh, he got his own treasure boat from his dad. And then within four or five days, he said he didn't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, Mm -hmm. you get it. You get it. We all know people like this. Or we don't necessarily know them, because I don't know anyone who's ever gotten a treasure boat from their dad on a whim, but I've known (laughs) of people with similar tendencies. Um, So he lost interest in less than a week, and uh, he was this very live large sort of guy. He just wanted to be in everyone's face. He wanted to annoy people because he got a kick out of it. For example, he once found out that his extremely loud monster truck, which, by the way, he would like park in the front yard of his house. Uh, He found out that people were annoyed. His neighbors were complaining about how loud his monster truck was. So he he cut off the muffler so that it would be even louder. (laughs) And (laughs) he actually wound up in the news for it, like labeled as a nuisance. And. In the photo, he's like proudly posing with his monster truck. Uh, disgusting. You know, disgusting. He, he, by the way, I think lives in my neighborhood because there's someone who, uh, <laughs> it seems as the days go on, the car gets louder. I don't know uh, what he's doing. It's the worst. So I absolutely side with the neighbors. I in this. can't stand when you hear someone start the revving and you're like, oh, we're in for uh, a solid 30 seconds of this nonsense. You know, I we, guess we have to wait. In our neighborhood, I mean, it's not, our neighborhood is very close to like the main street and all that. So like cars are always driving by, but it's wild when we're walking on like the main street and we hear the same sound from, like, we know what the car looks like just because outside of our home, we have seen the car driving and we're like, so you can pinpoint it. I'm like, oh, that's the car that pisses us off every night. Oh, it's the guy with the giant penis. Yeah. (laughs) I know. I think you meant giant treasure boat, but yes, uh, same thing. Oh, sorry. That's the name of the boat. Um, the giant penis. <laughs> I have a giant penis is what it's called. Just in case anyone was wondering. Um, <laughs> imagine the fan art of the 
<laughs> treasure boat. <laughs> also, He's... like I played a lot of uh, Ocean Barbie Ocean Discovery as a child, and I discovered a lot of treasures, and it was a lot of hard work. So I can I can see why after and a few days he was zero dollars. By the way, and also I made zero dollars. Believe it or not, but you also spent zero dollars. Like you, it, you did his whole thing. And you wow. didn't have to bother anybody financially. That's right. My mom just paid nineteen ninety nine at uh, for your entertainment to buy me the CD ROM. <laughs> Bingo. That's all you had okay. to do. Honestly, easy enough. He should get uh, get a tip from an entrepreneur like me. Just the tip on his boat called just I the Have a Penis. <laughs> just the tip. Somewhere for... in there, there's a semen joke of him being there... a semen. Oh God. Well, there it is. Uh, he is just a dast he's a douchebag and um even though chris is the more like level-headed cerebral guy by all accounts um as we can tell the bar is low so he's mm-hmm. not really that impressive of a guy <laughs> that's because they started using steroids both of them um because they were bodybuilders uh amateur bodybuilders of course, of course and they for five want- days just for <laughs> five days and they wanted to one-up each other right they're like always competing and so they both tar- start taking steroids to bulk up and be the bigger, the bigger one. You know, they're always trying to one up each other. So they have this new hobby and Chris decides he's going to buy steroids from an online dealer in Eastern Europe. So the steroids arrive. This is like in the 90s, by the way. So the steroids arrive and they are hidden in an unassuming VHS tape. Ooh. Hmm so sneaky so chris used some of this and then sold the rest to friends this became a pattern they were he was selling them to his friends and he got caught and he got charged with his first felony in 2003 he was sentenced to eight months in prison and he was allowed to serve in a work release program so he could continue working for his father's construction business and his dad kept kind of giving them second chances and 18th chances and 11,000th chances letting them work for the company thinking like okay they figured out they've learned their lesson and they're back to hard work so that's not what happened uh they did what they wanted. Um, they got away with pretty much everything, and they barely ever had to apologize. Maybe pick up some trash on the side of the road. Ew. Uh, no. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> I want to be treasure hunting, them. daddy. <laughs> yeah, it must have been a tough life. Uh, <laughs> eventually, Jeff and Chris said, you know, we're two entrepreneurs. Why don't we start a business together? So they start a business. It's called South Beach Rejuvenation. Okay. Okay. Uh, This is a hormone replacement clinic where they provided testosterone and HGH, human growth hormone, to athletes. And the way that this would operate is that, quote unquote, patients would attend a telemedicine appointment by phone and were immediately prescribed steroids, which were delivered straight to their homes. Like, just not really. (laughs) Nobody got... A no. You know what I mean? Like, uh-huh. there's really no barrier to accessing this stuff uh, through these guys. They did blood work, quote unquote, but it was just for show um, because mm-hmm. everyone was immediately approved. So it was, you know, a racket. And so the two brothers wanted to buy out similar competing clinics. And so they met up with this guy named 38 year old. His name's not 30 year old. <laughs> <laughs> They met up with this 38-year-old guy named Dr. Overstreet. Now, Dr. Overstreet was locally named, known as the Candyman. Oh, yikes. Big yikes. Uh, He's called the Candyman because he tells them the real money is in pain management clinics and painkillers. Opiates. So... The two brothers are like, shit, we're in. Uh, They pay (laughs) easy. They hear easy money and they're like, fuck yeah. Uh, So they pay $36 at the local tax collector's office for a license to sell pain medication without any further inquiry. Despite having a felony. He's a convict. Despite having a felony on his record, they don't even look into it because back then in Florida, there was basically no oversight on opiates. And so... They just got this license to sell drugs. Uh, They're not medically experienced. 
they have prison records. Wow. But I guess they can give out. So did they end up, the if they were trying to buy out the Candyman, it sounds like they ended up just joint, like being in cahoots with him. Yeah, so they met up with him, and basically he said, hey, why don't you buy into this business? We'll, we'll start you off. I'll, we'll, I'll show you the ropes, and then you can kind of start building your own, like, oh, empire, okay. sort of. And he would get a cut. Uh, I see. Okay. Yeah, so he kind of taught them the ropes, and they paid this 36 bucks. They got the license, and in no time, Chris and Jeff were each running their own pain clinic. Uh there was South Coast Pain Clinic and East Coast Pain Clinic. And Dr. Overstreet owned 50% of the business and the brothers co-owned 50%. But only weeks into the operation, Dr. Overstreet died in a car crash. Mm-hmm. And the brothers realized, oh, fuck yeah. Now we don't have to share it with him. So mm-hmm. they're now hi- quickly hiring their own doctors. They are uh, apparently hiring these doctors via Craigslist. Um, <laughs> they put they put up posts on Craigslist saying, we will pay you per patient, like thousands of dollars. It's basically for anybody. The vibe was if you have lost or if you have um, been fired from a practice for doing something unsavory or we'll give you a second chance yeah welcome to our club yeah we'll let you in and we'll pay you big bucks and so there were there's like a former proctologist a plastic surgeon like just these random doctors signed up to participate and they were paying these doctors per patient uh rather than as shareholders and so the idea behind the pain clinics was shockingly simple the doctors would just dangerously over prescribe oxycodone and xanax among other drugs to virtually every single patient that visited the clinic oh my god yeah and because they were paid per patient they had an incentive to see as many and prescribe as many pills as possible yeah and like and i don't know enough about the pharmaceutical world but like the people who have to send you xanax when you run out did they not notice that those clinics were running out of xanax a lot faster than any other pharmacy um no because they were able to prescribe the drugs in-house and give them in-house fulfill the prescriptions in-house okay so they had like a one-stop shop uh, Uh uh where you go in it's not only the prescription but also the pharmacy so they would you'd walk out and they'd say all right here's your pills bye uh and you'd leave so it's a easy in and out wild and because they were paid per patient these doctors they had this incentive to see as many patients as possible and eventually patients were in there for only 45 seconds to three (gasps) minutes oh my god per patient and uh Allegedly at one point, at least from the, I say allegedly because I wasn't sure if this was factual, but it was mentioned by a reporter in a documentary I watched. Uh, Reportedly, one of these clinics could rake in $50,000 in a single week. Oh, my God. Like they were making bank. Oh, my God. What a scandal. What a scam. Scam and scandal. Scam. Scandal. Yeah. It's a scandal. So... Jeff and Chris also paid the doctors $1,000 extra a week to use their DEA registration. So they needed their medical license and DEA registration, which Blaze had to have when he was doing um, when he was doing the opiate withdrawal for people and helping. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, my God, Christine, it's been so long. I'm sorry. He's going to kill me. Whatever. But when he was prescribing that, he needed that license. And so, you know. If you had that license and you wanted to make some big bucks really fast, you could join this place. They would give you $1,000 a week if you went online and ordered the maximum amount of pills that your DEA registration would allow you to purchase. Mm -hmm. And it would get shipped straight to their in-house pharmacy so they could just peddle it out to people as they came in. 
So they were running a racket, profiting off sales of pain medication, and they were not the only ones. Uh, Once drug dealers heard about how easy it was to get prescription drugs at these clinics, they also wanted to get in on it. And, for example, one dealer visited as a patient to check out the clinic. The doctor told him to stretch down and touch his toes. He said he couldn't, and so the doctor prescribed him 180 oxycodone tablets for his pain. (laughs) I also can't touch my toes, by the yeah, way. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So, uh, hand them over. <laughs> yeah, I guess Jeez. so. And you would have been able to. Uh, and so he was prescribed a total of 240 pills at his next appointment. Oh, so, oh my God. Wow. Starting at 180, going to 240. You can see how this is becoming a big problem very fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The guy said it was just so simple. And uh, like, I have an experience in a different uh, f- realm of this but when i lived in la we when we first moved there uh marijuana was still me- uh medicinal only mm-hmm. uh it became recreational soon afterward but at the time i was like oh i'm gonna get a medical marijuana card did i ever use it no but i went and got it just in case yeah and uh i went in and i was all nervous like oh my gosh like, I want to make sure I ace this test. The guy basically right. said, like, oh, do you have any trouble sleeping? And I'm like, yeah, um, I do. And he's like, okay, here's your prescription. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that what? Oh, I thought that was just, like, one of many questions. Nope. That's how – that's uh, in a different way. When I went to go get diagnosed for ADHD, I thought I was going to have to, like, pass a uh, – yeah, like, pass a test. Or, like, I needed yeah. to say the right things, which, like, I – I was just scared that I was going to overthink it and then they wouldn't take me seriously. But before they even start asking me any questions within like two sentences, they were like, you have ADHD, right? (laughs) And I I guess I could just tell by the way I talk. So, and I will say those companies are also getting so much scrutiny about like the Mm -hmm. lack of oversight on um, ADHD medication too. So I think that's like the next thing they're going to, the government's going to like, buckle down on because yep. i've witnessed that a lot where it's like you just hop on they're like it's just an app you go on five minutes and they prescribe you ritalin and i'm like holy shit yeah. uh <laughs> you know i mean i would say it's probably a a more legit operation by far than what's happening here but it does have similar overtones vibes yeah, yeah. vibes Another dealer started sending random people he called his patients, as in like Uh his clients, uh, to the clinic. And he told them if they got prescribed pain medication, he would buy them back from them for $500. These patients would make a quick $500 for just going in there and not touching their toes, I guess. (laughs) And then this dealer would be able to sell the pills at an enormous profit on the street. So he sent 10 to 15 people to the clinics every day, and he was making, in cash, daily five to $6,000, just doing nothing, just basically selling what he was getting from these people. Wow. Before long, of course, word spread uh, outside of Florida and up in Kentucky, people, because uh, my current fair state uh, has struggled with a lot of... uh, drug problems stuff? when it comes to <laughs> stuff <laughs> when it comes to uh, opiates you know mm-hmm. it's a it's a rough time here and Appalachia especially and so people began to hear word that there was this clinic in Florida in South Florida where you could drive walk on in and leave with a bunch of painkillers mm-hmm. And so people from Kentucky started traveling to South Florida several times a week to pick up drugs, and then they would drive back and sell them in Kentucky for a profit. Some of the medications were unknown in the region, and the dealers, what they would do is give them away to get people hooked. But then, uh, as we now know, opiates are an extremely addictive substance, and so people would pretty much get hooked immediately and then the demand would skyrocket yeah uh out of uh, the police made an interesting point that like they in appalachia they were like we knew that we knew the street price for oxy and it was 30 dollars a pill 
And he's like, and then one day we, one of our informants said, by the way, uh, oxy prices have dropped to $10 a pill. And they're like, that's Ooh. suspicious. <laughs> yeah. So basically they started looking into it, realizing people were getting these just like heaps of pills from Florida, bringing them back. And uh, so, you know, now they were able to meet the demand, the price dropped. Uh, and so that's kind of how they started to catch on to what was going on. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. So out-of-state <laughs> dealers also started renting buses to carry, quote-unquote, patients to Florida for pain medication. And they claimed wow. to be sponsoring sick people who needed access to medical care. Uh, they were mostly people with addiction who wanted a refill on their pain mm -hmm. meds. One group drove in a bus that said Tree of Life Baptist Church on the side, and <laughs> they all wore matching T-shirts to try and pass as a church group on a mission to provide health care to those in need. That was their backstory. Wow. there's, it, I mean, it's just wild that it was um, everyone's in on it. Like, it's yes. like we're not even, like, pretending like, oh, no, everyone's here for individual reasons. It's like, no, no, we're all... Oh, no. Yeah. We're all playing there's, this together. There's no subtlety at all. And I'm sure there, you know, there were people, I'm sure there were people who went in genuinely for sincere, but a lot of these <laughs> addictions start that way. Like you have genuine pain, like you have back pain, yeah. you have uh, XYZ chronic pain conditions. And so it's hard because it's like, yeah, people are addicted, but it doesn't mean like they weren't using it originally for the intended purpose. And a lot of times... People are prescribed opiates totally above board and then become addicted and have to find the drug elsewhere. Yeah. So it's not it's not necessarily like, oh, they're just like doing drugs. It's like, you know, now they feel they need it to stop the pain or, you know, what have you. Um, so I'm sure some of them going in there genuinely had real chronic pain conditions. Um, but overall. It was just quite a racket. Hmm. Uh, Jeff himself would simply sell drugs to a directly to a local dealer who would then sell them on the streets. And so Jeff at this point is like, we're not even pretending. Like, I'm selling straight to drug dealers at this point. As business boomed, the brothers needed more staff. They hired their male friends to work in their offices, and they hired female staff off of Craigslist ads that required women to submit photos of themselves to be considered. Oh. Cool. Great. Okay. They also eventually hired their mother, Denise. Do you think she had to send in a photo? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, and Chris put his girlfriend in charge, who became his wife, uh, in charge of an entire third clinic that saw nearly 200 patients a day. Wow. the f I know, it's crazy. At first, the clinic offices were like frat houses, according to one of Chris's employees. They did shots, they drank beer, they shot each other with tasers and anything else they could think of, just like oh fucking around. Yeah, they're just like totally fucking around. But Chris decided the business needed to look more legitimate. Every day, there were lines of patients out the door, down and across the street. And of course, neighbors were getting A, suspicious, and B, mm -hmm. pissed off. Because there's sure. like people like just camped out in front of this building, sometimes like 45 people in the rain. And, you know, like how did they not? How did people not catch on earlier? How did like the neighbors, like the police not show up and be like, we've never seen a pharmacy with a line out the door? Like, so, I, you know, it's hard to say. I think it's a lot of things. I think part of it is that there just was no legal regulation really of mm. this kind of thing. So it was like, well, it seems relatively above board. Like they have a license, you know? And yeah. so at first it, it seemed, um, like eh, it's shady but not much we can do but honestly um really quickly people were like what the fuck is going on here we're sure get okay, to the bottom okay. Of it. yeah yeah so it didn't last that long um so it's looking shady especially because people would leave the clinics with their prescriptions and immediately start to misuse them like shoot up in the parking lot and i guess uh the pills they were prescribing were water soluble, which was something that um, people who suffered from addiction 
preferred because you could crush it up and inject oh. it. Oh, 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 okay. Or snort it and it would hit your bloodstream instantly. And so people would just hop in their cars in the parking lot or even just like on the sidewalk Jesus. next to the building and like shoot up. And so people were sleeping on the sidewalks. People were, you know, I mean, it's, it's. I mean, even like the, it had, to, they had to bring in like a whole like demographic of people that are now just like in neighborhoods that were never there before. And now they're just all like camped out on streets and yeah, yeah, yeah. It really pissed off the neighbors and like the neighbors were saying, you know, I had a shop across the street. I looked out and there's like fights breaking out in the parking lot because people are, you know, high or mad about or whatever passing they, out in the street or like passing on the just... street. Like it, police are getting, called because you know brawls are starting like they are definitely not being inconspicuous at all and one thing you know you think about the people who would drive there from really far away people would camp out out front because they were like i want my fix and they'd wake up um in withdrawals and would want to be the first in line right when I they mean, opened i mean if i had an addiction and i knew this place i would just never leave that street corner i would just yeah i mean it makes total sense like where are you gonna i would get high pass out wake up go back inside yeah yeah and so this is what it was becoming and of course chris uh kind of realized this is not a good look uh and he wanted to make it look a little more legitimate and he said okay authority neighbors are getting mad and suspicious authorities are going to start looking into this And he was, like, kind of waiting for an investigation to start. He knew it was going to happen. But so far, there was nothing. And that means it gave him time to hire retired DEA investigator Lewis Fisher as their consultant. And so Lewis's job was to inspect the clinics and submit a report to the major drug manufacturers who supplied the opiates. So he basically is saying... Don't worry, Chris, as long as you keep organized records of your patients and inventories, everything would be fine. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, yeah, good luck with that. So sometimes drug distributors would visit to do inspections before they would sign off on sending more deliveries for obvious reasons. Like, why are they buying 10,000 oxys? Mm-hmm. You know, it like I'm sure there were people who were like, we got to do a little quality control and like pop on in and see see where this stuff is all going. And so when an interviewer asked whether those inspectors found anything suspicious, uh, Lewis said, suspicious is not really defined in the law. It's a judgment call. I'm like, that oh. seems like you're just trying to evade telling us what was so suspicious. I was going to say, but... it sounds like you're friends with these guys and not really trying to uphold anything. <laughs> yeah, it seems like you're not mm, telling us the whole truth and nothing about the truth. It was hugely profitable. This is where it gets dicey because you have to remember that these giant pharmaceutical companies that are technically above board are also raking in the billions because mm-hmm. they're 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 profiting off of all these drugs being bought and made. And so they were pretty easily able to ignore the red flags. In fact, it was profitable for everyone because a single delivery to the clinic could be worth $1 million on the streets. So it was almost like they were funneling money into the area this way, Oof. in the worst way, in the worst possible way. Uh, opiates were all but totally unregulated in Florida. So the drugs just kept coming and there was not really anything to stop it. You know, uh, they were out on the streets just as fast as they arrived at the clinics. They were just being, what do you call it? Just being, I don't know, shoved out the door and just being sure thrown yeah. out like candy sure. into the crowd. Um, <laughs> I don't know why that was my imagery. You know what a parade when they throw candy? Anyway. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Okay, good, 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 good. So to further legitimize his prescribing doctors, Chris hired a man who owned a mobile, 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 mobile MRI unit. Um, oh, okay. That'll do it. I bet that was yeah. also a Craigslist ad, uh, just a guess. Just I a guess. feel like he's going to show up and like this MRI will just be like a, a, some weird garage <laughs> contraption. It's like, it's like stick your head in here. <laughs> it's like an off-brand tablet that he's like, just uh, stand against that wall. And we'll As it's scan like zapping. You. It's like, yeah. 
<laughs> it makes some sound effects. It's just an app he downloaded. Yeah. I feel like that's kind of what was happening, um, especially when you consider that they installed the mobile MRI unit behind the neighboring strip club. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and that is where they would conduct these uh, alleged MRIs. Anyone who wanted pain medication could go to the mobile MRI machine and their MRI results were sent to one of the George's pain clinics within the hour. And then the doctor would prescribe pain medication to treat whatever injuries or not injuries, I guess, that the MRI detected. So while this is all going on, like, I hope they knew. I feel like Chris knew. Jeff might not have known. But they were heading toward... A catastrophe? Tr- <laughs> catastrophe. And that's exactly the word. Catastrophe. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Trouble was a brewing. okay? Uh, by the time local investigators were really beginning to get to the bottom of this, most of the George's patients were not even from the state of Florida. They were traveling thousands of miles from other states to get to the clinics and jeff george said in an interview while laughing we created a new form of tourism so (laughs) he finds this (laughs) hilarious meanwhile competitors started opening pain clinics throughout florida which became known as pill mills oh my god chris led basically a pain clinic mafia he and his friends terrorized their competitors Uh, With threatening phone calls, he would even show up and harass them in the parking lot before they went into work that day. He was trying to reign supreme as the Florida Pain Clinic. He did not want these competitors messing with his business. They once even used ball bearings and slingshots to shoot out and destroy an office's windows and computers. Just to... uh, Just to give them an advantage i guess i feel it but like and i I guess it's just the growing up with no consequences and like somehow still getting away with this after all this time but Mm -hmm. like i feel like their thought is probably we'll we'll just call our lawyer and just you know you can do whatever you want we can slingshot windows and cause threat like those are real issues like i think that's assault and also property damage and it's wild that they just, it doesn't even occur to them to like, oh, this isn't something our lawyer, like, can't handle. Yeah, like, we'll get out of it some way or another. Yeah, it's just so There's brazen. always a way out. That's the thought process. And, oh, God, it's just, uh, it just gets so much worse. Okay. So, still, despite their uh guerrilla tactics i guess uh more pain clinics opened as demand increased and as media started putting pressure on the george's clinics for all the trouble they were causing uh major drug distributors simply advised chris to change their business name to shake off the scrutiny <laughs> basically to what, to what? <laughs> american pain okay boring <laughs> but the fact that the drug companies were the ones that said, change the name, make it sound more legitimate. Mm-hmm. Like, they're totally in on it. Yeah. It's sick. Th- th- there had to be someone higher up that was in on it. Did they get busted? Like, or were they just this clueless? Like, <sighs> No, I mean, I think, like, the drug companies are just such big stalwart like there's just nothing no recourse you know wild so they're saying okay why don't you change the name then people won't be as suspicious uh so they did they became american pain meanwhile opiate deaths were through the fucking roof Mm -hmm. hospitals and first responders were seeing overdoses dui accidents beyond anything they had ever experienced it was shocking it was upsetting uh to everyone but the george brothers So a retired FBI agent who worked on the case said the George brothers did not start the opioid crisis, but they sure as hell poured gasoline on the fire. They became the largest street level distribution group operating in the entire United States. Mm. Nobody put nobody put more pills on the streets than they did. Nobody. That's incredible. And like it's it's incredible. All right. So, I mean, they were they did i don't know if they were fully responsible but they 
definitely were partially responsible then for at least a few overdose deaths, right? Oh, yes. Yes. And we will definitely get into that. Okay. Okay. You're exactly right. Okay. Of the 20 physicians who prescribed the most oxycodone in the entire country, five, so 25% of them, worked at just one of Chris's clinics. Oh, my God. Oh, my <laughs> That's God. That's how bad this place was. But, of course, competitive as ever, Chris is like, hell yeah, that's a win for us. You know, not seeing, like, the giant red flags of, like, um, you're going to get busted. Okay. I like how he's trying to high five people on this. <laughs> right? He's, like, so impressed. He's like, I guess I'm out of buy another treasure boat. You know, like, <laughs> okay, fuck you. He did not think this would be a red flag. He basically said, I wanted my doctors to be the top prescribing doctors in the country. To me, that was an accomplishment. And to that I say, it's okay. not an accomplishment if you just say, everyone can get pills. Here you go. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not pat really on the back for you then. High five. Yeah. Good job, bud. Chris eventually sold nearly half a billion, with a B, oh. pills. <gasps> and half a billion pills just under Chris's operation. I would and- be living under, like, unbridled fear. Like, just terror. Just total terror that today's the day i'm gonna get busted today's the day i'm gonna get busted for like, sure at least like half a billion you have to at least look at the numbers of other places and kind of pretend to match pretend them like to like be legit a little bit but no oh my god they've just I'd lost be, all grasp of reality here i'd be just so terrified and it's almost a good thing in the end because it's what got them caught but still it's like how fucked up that they had to the the amount of those pills that ended up killing people causing addiction creating addiction i mean it's it's really Mm -hmm. sickening chris jeff and all of their employer employees knew very well that people were dying this was in the papers every day these opioid deaths uh in florida as you can imagine incredibly high numbers daily of people dying of overdoses they just did not give a shit they didn't give a single shit i'll give you an example When Chris found out three patients had driven away from his clinic after misusing the medication they received from him and got hit by a train, (gasps) which killed two of the passengers, he laughed on the phone and said, you got to be an idiot to get hit by a train. (gasps) Oh, my God. That was like his literal reaction. Oh, my God. I don't know if it was happening yet, but authorities were definitely tapping their phones. So that would be a very chilling thing to overhear, you know? Yeah. Uh, It's really, uh, oh, speaking of chilling, investigators later said they found the brother's absolute lack of care for human life, quote, chilling. Mm -hmm. Uh, The FBI, DEA, IRS, and local authorities were closing in on the clinics, but they needed more hardcore hard-hitting evidence of the crimes before they like really swooped in okay when other clinics started to get raided john paul george the dad got nervous for his sons and thought "Uh uh-oh because he's no he knows he knows what the fuck they're up to Mm -hmm. like he's suddenly buying his own treasure boats okay (laughs) so his dad (laughs) his dad's like wait a second he's not asking me for money he must be Something's, doing some sort of some sort of racket is going on yeah something suspicious is happening and he called chris and he said the arrests are widening so i don't know be careful or something great advice thank you dad <laughs> or something <laughs> chris insisted he was doing nothing wrong and therefore couldn't get in trouble and john paul his dad said don't think they're not building a case chris and so he suggested chris put his assets offshore in belize to hide them classic classic instead the brothers hid four million dollars in safes in their mom's attic in case investigators did search their houses they did spoiler alert (laughs) uh and the clinics chris believed jeff was being too careless with his dealings and would soon be arrested but chris thinking he was like the more savvy business-minded one and like less the kind of uh Mm -hmm. creative whatever one he thought okay jeff is being an idiot he's gonna get arrested but i am being super careful so i'm fine (sighs) famous last words yep 
In reality, both brothers were living outrageous lifestyles, spending millions on cars, boats, houses, trips, and anything they wanted. Like, just the classic trope of, like, you illegally obtain all this money and suddenly you have, like, three Bentleys in the garage and... It, it like, doesn't surprise me at all, but they're, like their impulsiveness to do anything of course it would fall into them spending yes exactly and they would spend it like that and on other people on women on strip clubs on cigars like and you know just the cliche of like what a 30 year old douchebag would spend his illegally earned millions of dollars on the backs of people who are overdosing right Ah, so you get it The FBI just had to prove there was a crime being committed. They could not mess this up. It was difficult to get anyone undercover as a patient. Uh, Derek Nolan was Chris's longtime friend and the muscle of the operation. Yeah, this like any like any uh, reputable (laughs) medical (laughs) office. There's a a muscle. Yeah. (laughs) Like, okay. Uh, But I can see why they would need security. You know, if if people are either high or they're uh, trying to get their fix or what have well, you. Well, someone's like, even sure... a, like attacking them or want more or they're yes! upset with the Like a, tensions account. could really escalate very fast. So I do understand it. Um, but so Derek Nolan, he was the muscle, so to speak. And what he would do is stand in the office and keep people under control. And uh, if he didn't, people basically treated the, the clinic like they described it as like Mardi Gras. Every. Oh, my God. Places would just park in the parking lot, campers, hang out all day outside, partying. It was like Woodstock. They were just like taking getting pills. Yeah, up. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, taking pills, uh, bringing their campers from other states and just parking out in the parking lot. Um, it was just chaotic. And so patients could also bribe secretaries to get earlier MRI appointments or faster prescriptions. So even what they're doing was not enough for some people. Like they were asking for more i mean this is addiction you know they're asking for earlier prescriptions for more pills and the secretaries pocketed so much cash daily from these bribes that chris started taxing them hundreds of dollars a day and they I was still gonna say, profited oh my god i was gonna say did was chris, were chris and jeff even aware that now like there were other wheelings and dealings inside great of this question. wheeling and dealing you know great question they apparently were And their solution was, fine, but I get a cut. (laughs) Okay, Okay. yikes. One clinic alone was bringing in tens of millions of dollars (gasps) at one clinic. Oh, my God. It's crazy. There was so much cash passing through their hands to fit in a register, they simply kept large garbage cans behind the counter, and they would just toss money into garbage bags, like the big lawn bags and and big metal trash bags. They would just store it in those they were like there's not room in the safe oh, there's not room in the what cash a problem register. to have <laughs> big pro- big problems to have yeah, that's where i keep up all my wads of cash too by the just way in so. the trash yeah, yeah. <laughs> sad there was too much cash oh sorry still derek tried to make the okay oh okay sorry So still, Derek, the muscle, tried to make the clinic look professional from the outside, and he prided himself on recognizing undercover officers and informants. So, lucky you, you can sniff them out. What a skill. Yeah, he's basically eyeing these people and saying, like, I don't trust this one. He looks like a cop, you know. So what would he do in that uh, event? Like, I'm sure they would probably say something like, oh, sorry, no appointments today. Yeah, right. Like, but like, that alone wouldn't petrify them into like getting their shit together because i'd be like if there's a cop in this place and everyone else is like clearly like an addict or going through something and desperate for like how how do they think that guy isn't taking inventory of what's happening in the room around him i mean my thought is (laughs) chris and jeff's dad told them they're smarter than the police and right, okay. don't worry about it so my thought is they probably were like oh yeah they're trying to see if anything shady is going on but it's not they probably convinced themselves they're doing this 
technically above board and no consequences. So Wild. as long as we kick them out before they can, you know, actually get anything on us. I can't um, imagine having that kind of confidence. I can't and imagine that pressure. For, like, yeah, I would crumble immediately under that kind of pressure. But oh, yeah, I guess not. So one undercover investigator flew right under Derek's little nose and he <gasps> did not catch on. Well, I love that because I love when a narcissist says he's good at something and then he's not. So eee! it's like, I'm really well, good at fi the... figuring out the cops. This is the security guy, Derek, oh, right, the friend. Right, 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 right. So, right. I mean, who's to say he's not also a narcissist? I don't know that. But he is the... Let me, let me rephrase. Let me rephrase. I love when men say that they're good at something <laughs> and then they're not. <laughs> I love when a man named Derek tries to tell me he knows everything about other people and then just fucking gets duped, you know? Gotcha, Derek. Yeah. Gotcha, Derek. Uh, so one undercover investigator flew under the radar. And let me tell you why. Because he looked just like George and Jeff, like the roided out bros. Shut that, up. Oh my yeah, God. He, which is hilarious. This undercover cop was like, oh, I can get in there. Watch. Right. He was this really bulky dude. He wore a, an Affliction brand t shirt to work one day. So, this guy, he, so Sersha wrote a note here that, like, literally says, I'm not even joking. Picture a buffer Zach Baggins. <laughs> <laughs> said that's the vibe down to the shirt brand but this is oh. what this guy wore every day and so one day he went to work and his other investigators his boss said hey would you want to join this case undercover and he's like okay he shows up to the clinic and they let him right on in he looks like one of them you know of course of course he told the prescribing doctor that he drinks several beers a day, and he thought this would help him blend in, but the doctor said he felt uncomfortable prescribing medication to someone who drinks frequently, so he brought Chris in to consult as an expert. Expert. Uh, so Chris comes in, and he's like, oh, yes, I have medical background. Like, obviously, this undercover officer knows that's not true. Um, and he told him, you know what, why don't you go to a different clinic? Uh, Chris said, I'll, uh, I'll call ahead. I'll make sure you get in right away and, uh, just make sure you leave out any details about the drinking. Cause they pro they mm. might not prescribe it if you say that, but just lie about that. And you can go over to this <laughs> other clinic. <laughs> so the investigator is like, well, man, I'd hate for you to lose out on business. Like he's clearly trying to get this guy to be like, you're right. Here's a bunch yeah. of pills. But Chris replied, dude, all the clinics are exactly the same. Don't even worry about it. Uh -huh. And that was uh -oh. enough evidence. That was enough evidence because they needed proof of medical fraud, prescription fraud, and even tax fraud. And wow. they felt like, you know what? We've got we've got enough. So on March 3rd, 2010, the Georges Empire came crashing down when the FBI, the DIA, IRS, and County Sheriff's Office used warrants to raid the clinics as well as Chris's house, Jeff's, and even their mother, Denise, where, remember... They hid $4 million in the attic. Mm -hmm. yep. Jeff, Chris, Denise, and 29 others, including 13 doctors, were charged under the federal RICO Act, which targets organized crime. So Ooh. now they're considered like an organized crime pocket. Well, they had the muscle. So I guess they had a muscle. You're automatically in at that point. Denise was charged with 30 months in prison for conspiracy to commit wire fraud uh, because she had lied on paperwork to misrepresent how many patients were coming from out of state. Basically, they'd been cooking the books and the whole family was in on it. Gotcha. Chris pleaded guilty to racketeering conspiracy. He was sentenced to 17 years in prison, but only wow. served 11 and was released in 2021. Jeff also pleaded guilty to a racketeering charge and was sentenced to 15 and a half years. He was also found guilty of second degree felony murder due to a patient's fatal overdose linked to his clinic, which came Ooh. with a second 20 year sentence. Oh, shit. And he is still in prison. Investigators painstakingly processed the files for 28,000 patients that had gone through. <gasps> 
And by the way, that's 28,000 individual patients. And most of these people were coming again and again, weekly, monthly, oh, some daily. Oh, my God. Yeah. I so can't 20, imagine the paperwork. 28,000, but times however many visits per patient, you know. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. 28,000. And from those files, they pulled 300 random files because they're like, we're not going through all 28,000. Pick 300 random ones. And they found that a shocking of those 300 patients, 10% of them had died due to overdose <gasps> or DUI incidents. Oh, my God. 10%. Of oh, my God. The random sample had died due to overdose and DUI incidents. That's crazy. That's crazy. Wow. That meant an estimated 3,000 deaths could be directly linked to th these two brothers mm -hmm. and their patients, which doesn't even include the deaths due to the pills that were just brought to other states and sold on the street, you know? Like, these pills went farther than just these patients. Like, drug dealers right. were coming in and getting pills and selling them. So, that's so we don't even, even know how many people yeah. it reached. Yeah. Yeah. So, it must have, I mean, you know. It, but we can just guess we at can least 3,000 people died. We can imagine. Like, 3,000 is, is the actual number they believe were linked to the brothers. Like, that's a pretty wow. good, pretty solid guess. We just don't know beyond the scope right. of their patients, like how many people in Appalachia or wherever uh, died as a result of these pills crossing state borders. Oh, my God. And uh, despite largely being considered the kingpin of the country's worst and biggest opiate operation of all time, Chris feels like he did nothing wrong. Of course. Well, he's better than everybody. So uh, and he's an right. entrepreneur. He's, he's an Daddy entrepreneur. said so. He said in an interview, it's their responsibility. They're responsible for themselves. I'm not. I don't think we created more addicts. They were already here. Okay. Oh, shut up. Oh, Especially shut like, fuck up. like, you know, he's one of those people who's like, well, I didn't make them take the drugs. It's like, what are you talking about? They're it's, addicts. Like, what are you talking about? Like, they, you, you, you encouraged knew. it. You encouraged you this. You knew people were dying because you were giving them easy access it's sick and also like not for nothing but these think about the people who had never touched the drug yeah went maybe yeah. just to try it or had pain went there and all of a sudden they had like full-blown access and they've fallen deep into this addiction because they opened the door for them you know exactly yeah i think one of the like they in, they actually in one of the documentaries they um interviewed uh victims of these guys and for example there were two moms whose kids died uh <gasps> as, of overdoses one girl was 18 um oh. and one son was i think 30 30 30 something and they talked about like they these people killed my daughter like they made it possible yeah. for her to have easy access they didn't know checks nothing just like sign a paper was part go. of was part of their um charges the uh, like third degree murder or manslaughter or something no so the only charge was the one that uh jeff got uh let me see which was the second degree felony murder due to uh a patient's fatal overdose linked to the mm, clinic that right. was the only one that really stuck or went okay. anywhere and he did get 20 years for that but yeah everyone else just kind I mean, of they'd be in jail for life if that was oh, it. yeah oh, like yeah. for life and another life and another life yeah yeah i feel like that would have to be just multiplied exponentially okay let's see blah, blah, blah. however despite denying that he did anything wrong chris also said they didn't want to go after big pharma. They didn't want to go after big distributors. They just wanted us. We're nobodies. The money we made is peanuts compared to what big pharma made over the years. But and we're victims. We're <laughs> yeah, victims. we're victims now. Okay. I mean, it is true that major pharmaceutical companies continue to come under 
well-deserved fire for their alleged mishandling of opiates. This is like obviously a big thing in the news right now. Even drugstores like Walgreens, Walmart, and CVS have agreed to lawsuit settlements in the billions for their roles in the opiate crisis. Mm -hmm. But communities throughout the country continue to struggle with substance abuse disorders, SUD. And according to experts, criminalizing and regulating drugs is only a small piece of the puzzle, uh, although it is where most of the funding goes. I think that's how our country usually sets up these kind of uh, attacks on mm -hmm. war on drugs. In fact, experts have found that SUDs don't fit the biological and genetic mold that we've been presented with for so long. So this is really oh. interesting. Uh, many people believe some people are just more likely to have substance use disorders based on genetics or some other fact that there's simply nothing to be done if you are genetically predisposed. But apparently the reality is far more complicated. Oh, Many okay. people misuse medication and use illicit drugs to avoid, say, the crushing reality of poverty, to escape like the day-to-day -day abuse they face uh, at the hands mm. of a partner, a parent. And... PTSD, trauma, just things that, you know, we can't even begin to imagine. Um, and so people cope in that way. And so it's not just like, oh, well, you started a drug. So you it's your fucking fault. You're an right. addict. You know, it's like, first of all, this is all legally like these pharmaceutical companies are making billions off of this. And then you turn to the at the person who's taking the drugs and you're like, Oh, you're just scum, you know? Yeah, yeah. It, it's all very, I don't know, classist, backwards. There's a lot of... A lot of isms. A lot of isms this. and a lot of uh, complexity to this. And of course, in a country <laughs> where we don't really get medical care... <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> um, people are seeking real pain relief from injuries, chronic illnesses... Mental illness. I mean, people are looking for help. They're looking for something to help with their uh, smothering, debilitating anxiety. So they're like, oh, OK, they'll give me Xanax. I'm I can't afford to go to well, a primary yeah, care pe doctor. People are just desperate for help. Yeah. For and, help. They, we, and we don't have a lot of access to help. So and the FDA approved opiates as a safe drug. So why are you blaming the people taking it? They they're taking I mean. They're taking something that the government said, A-okay, yep. go ahead. It's safe. It's legal. It's prescribed. Walgreens will give it to you. And, uh, you know, a lot of these people really, like, I started painkillers in college for my Crohn's disease, and it was the only thing that let me sleep at night. Like, I could not sleep if I hadn't taken a Percocet because I was in so much constant debilitating, like, the kind of pain where you... Well, the kind of pain where you have like six ulcers just bleeding out yeah. in your tum in your tummy, like just not, debilitating not a, pain, not equivalent uh, pain wise. But when I was up until I got my surgery for my heart, I was there was a really dark time where I was uh, really riddled with anxiety. I developed agoraphobia and like to an extreme level, I couldn't like open the door to grab like. DoorDash, like, and the only way I could survive was taking Xanax. And it was, and I remember thinking, oh, I could see how this could become a problem for people because right? it, it's so, it just makes you f be able to breathe. Or even if you're having anxiety, at least you're having incredibly less anxiety. And like, it's, it like helps you function. And like, yeah. this is a world where we have to function if we want to get the rent in on time or, you know pick our kids up from school or or do our job i mean whatever it is like it's such we don't live in a society where it's easy to address most health concerns in a mm -hmm. in an inexpensive and uh easily accessible way that is safe and i mean there's just s countless reasons why somebody might need xanax why somebody might need an opiate, a painkiller, oxy. Like, I mean, I mean, there's I get people it. every day. I was there. Like, there's also people every day that are on them just because they're just getting out of surgery, and like, yes. then there's a complication well, with the surgery, and now all of a sudden you're on it for longer, and then you just 
you I develop mean, like, this reliance on it and it's I, it's it I can have happen a, to anyone and it does happen to anyone i have a family member who has an incredibly bad back has had like 12 surgeries oh, yeah. on her back and is always on and off opiates on and off painkillers and like it's it's you know luckily that's not it hasn't become a situation for her, but how easy it could be a situation for it, anyone. It could be. And like I was in that boat as well where I was taking it. And I remember when I went back to the doctor and at the time I didn't, I was like 19. I didn't really realize at the time it was like 2009. It was probably in the height of all this opiate stuff uh, becoming more recognizable as a problem. But at the time, like, you know, it was still prescribed pretty regularly and I got that as a prescription because I was in so much pain and I was like oh thank god finally something that like helps like lets me go to class because I couldn't go to class unless I had taken something for the pain and I went in and I said like a few weeks later and I said okay I'd love another prescription it's really the only way that I can function during the day and she was like um no we are not prescribing you anymore and I remember walking out of the clinic and I had which now I know is a panic attack, but like I thought I was having a heart attack and I went to the yeah. roof of the hospital and I called my mom and I said, I'm driving home. And she was like, okay, uh, drive home. And I walked back to my dorm and I wrote a note to Allison and I said, I'm driving home to Ohio. Uh, bye. And I got in my car and I, that night I just drove all the way home and wow. I couldn't take a painkiller because I was driving. And so I was just screaming the entire drive, like just as a way of like distracting yeah. myself. I was just screaming, screaming. Um, but it's, it's like, I needed a pain, like I needed a painkiller to function. And so I, you know, it didn't get to that point because they cut me off obviously. And I didn't, have anyone to like buy from on the streets i don't know how to do that so <laughs> it could have gone in a very different direction like i didn't un even understand that it was addictive at the time i just thought well this is the only way i can get out of bed like it yeah. you know and so for uh, like i so deeply understand that and as someone who also takes clonopin i'm like i have to be really careful because you know you get to taking it you're like oh, i'll take an extra one today because i'm extra stressed mm -hmm. and it it can become such a vicious cycle um, and it's so it's so um under the radar when it first when it can first yes. start i think most people who are in like situations where they have drug problems they did not it did not start overnight no. it started with good intentions and things just going wrong but, exactly you know. a lot of times these start legally like how it would have gone with me like i got it from my doctor they refused to prescribe more maybe i went to a pain clinic and said i need this for my crohn's disease and you know it gets out of hand and it's an easy slippery slope and it's really not fair to say oh well these people uh they're in control of themselves not me like yeah okay guy yeah. um it, it's really really sad and scary and so I, anyway i just have quite a lot of empathy for people going through that and if you are going through that uh we're here for you there are there are a lot of resources uh that i'll tell you at the end that you can you can check out um because there is a way out even though it seems impossible so the National Harm Reduction Coalition uh, believes that drug use can never be fully eliminated from the world which I tend to agree with uh, but the risks of drug-related injuries and death can be reduced by allowing people access to education, other resources, uh, other mental health resources, other physical health resources. And they have eight foundational principles central to harm reduction. So I'm just going to read uh, a couple of them real quick. Number three is establishes quality of individual and community life and well-being not necessarily cessation of all drug use as the criteria for successful interventions and policies. So it's almost like improve your quality of life and your connection to community. You don't necessarily have to go cold turkey on drugs, mm -hmm. but we can at least structure things better for people to have, uh, I don't know, a more stable, a more supportive okay. community around them sure. number seven 
says, recognizes that the realities of poverty, class, racism, social isolation, past trauma, sex-based discrimination, and other social inequalities affect both people's vulnerability to and capacity for effectively dealing with drug-related harm. So Mm. it's not a one-size-fits-all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. You know, people uh, in uh, marginalized groups, for example, are much more likely to struggle getting out of this kind of a cycle, especially if they don't have the kind of community support and that kind of thing that we mentioned earlier. The idea is that socioeconomic issues must be tackled to make a real change in drug-related harm. So basically, it's a much broader issue than just police going out and saying, oh, I'm arresting you for having drugs. Right, right. Like, that's not going to do it. It's going to keep happening. Someone else is going to step in and sell drugs or take drugs. I mean, it, it, it's that's just a very small minded way to address the problem. Great point. Yeah. And so the idea is that we got to start with the socioeconomic issues and and focus on those if we're going to make a real change in drug related harm within communities, especially poverty stricken communities. And Mm -hmm. um, although drug use will always exist, uh, the goal is to make sure communities and individuals within them are able to stay safe and healthy, um, despite, you know, drugs probably being around forever. What in whatever form, uh, vapor drugs, uh, uh, what are they called? Um, holographic drugs in the future i don't know like i was gonna say like the drugs that don't even exist yet yeah that we've never even heard of with crazy names um you know i'm sure it'll always happen that's just kind of human societal nature uh but they're at least hoping to reduce harm uh which is i think a really really cool cool goal to have um yeah and so that is called the national harm reduction coalition uh and you can find them at harmreduction.org. And they have really great uh, resource center. And again, this is where I want to do my little shout out um, about naloxone. If you you know are able to, it's an awesome thing to have on hand. It basically reverses uh, you know the effects of an overdose. I mean, that's probably in very simplified terms. Um, let me just like read the actual definition so I don't. <laughs> What's it called again? So there's naloxone and Narcan. Narcan I've heard of. Yeah. Um, I just want to find like a... A definition. Yeah. So essentially what it does, I mean, it's basically what I said, but like probably said in a better way. Naloxone is a medicine that rapidly reverses an opioid overdose. Um, It's an opioid antagonist. And this is from the... uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse. Uh, this means, well, it's the sciencey stuff. You can, you guys can go read on your own. Um, but it can quickly restore breathing to a person if their breathing has slowed or stopped because of an opioid overdose. Um, mm-hmm. And it has no effect on somebody who has not taken, who has no opio- opioids in their system. Um, and it's also not a treatment for, uh, you know, op- opioid use disorder, uh, but it can help save a life. And so, yeah. you know, this is something we always had on us in LA. Um, and now, as we know, it's just a widespread nationwide uh, epidemic, really. Like it's, it's, uh, it's very, very scary. So if you can, uh, you know, grab yourself some Narcan, uh, <laughs> just in case, keep it in your just car. In case. Uh, you know, I'd see people sometimes like pull over, park the car and like help somebody on a street corner who was unconscious and it's like oh wow that kind of thing um so yeah you know it's uh it can't hurt to have on you it's it can la- save a life um restore someone's breathing if they're going through that and uh it's worth looking into so that is yeah. the story of the george brothers two motherfucking douche bags wow and for their as you said in the beginning for their dad to go eh, boys will be boys or i mean, oh, look I mean at yeah them. That's the crazy, crazy thing is like when he was interviewed, he's like, you know, they were always going a little too far with their shenanigans. And I'm like, uh-huh. Okay. Like, is that what we're calling it? We're just calling them rabble rousers. Look at them. Yeah, just... They're just a couple of little hooligans. Yeah. Oh, uh, God. Here, Here's a picture of him with his truck, by the way. Like you're going to you. lose your effing mind. Okay. Here is Jeff with his truck. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Gross. <laughs> God. He's standing next to it like if it were a fish, he would hold it. Like yes. he's like <laughs> Yes. Like you know and- that's on his like hinge profile or something. Oh he's <laughs> So gross. gross. Doesn't he look like uh He looks like Zach Bagan's friend. Yeah, he looks like the guy I want to look up Derek whatever. He looks like Nick Lachey kind of. Yes, yes, but like on steroids, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh Ugh. I want to know what Derek looked like because Sersha described it and I'm like I need to see this for myself. Um Derek Nolan. This monster truck I can't even stand. Like the monster like the- truck is ridiculous the eyes the whole situation he, like he's like trying to give a smolder but he's just giving douchebag face oh lord Ugh. Ugh. boys will be boys it's honestly beyond and the fact that it was so recent you know always is just jarring yeah um, with the with the amount it really does terrify me about how people can get away with something that's so obvious for so long because in my mind, that story had to have happened like decades and decades and decades before ago. Before the internet or something. Before the yeah. internet or before, before regulations. Phone or before yeah. regulations. I mean, it sort of was, it was sort of before regulations. It was like they got in this loophole where it was like, oh, you can definitely sell painkillers in wild. Florida for no reason whatsoever, you know? Um, and I will say too, like, I know this is kind of off track a little bit but my brother and i just did an episode uh on florida man we read reviews of florida man and it was like basically anything kind of florida man related and uh we ended up reading quite a few really interesting articles um about this the florida man trope and how it has some problematic connotations which like neither of us had really thought of before just because you know like they're funny you know like oh florida man drives uh (laughs) whatever through walmart front Mm -hmm. door you know with alligator in tow or whatever these like florida man articles are uh but a couple people wrote in and said and you know we had seen these articles as well and so we gave a caveat at the beginning of the show which of course pissed some people off but uh it was just to say like there's a reason why a lot of florida man stories happen in florida uh you know lack of mental health resources Mm. Uh, a lot of it is you know mental health problems that are not being treated um poverty uh disparity between classes you know it's there's so much to it that like it almost has a darker connotation when you like dig a little like scratch past the surface of like like haha this weirdo drove his thing into a walmart and you know it's like a lot of that is probably drugs, mental health, you know, things that are not being properly regulated because of some certain people who run that mm-hmm. state. Uh, so, yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about, yeah. like, especially when I read this. I was like, aha, I see how sure Florida could become a place where this would happen because, like, this stuff isn't getting regulated. Yeah. Florida um, man only exists because Florida's maybe needs to not, update some yeah, things not taking care of its people you know mm-hmm. and so anyway that's all that's my soapbox uh i'll hop right off and uh let you talk for a second oh well here uh, here i am and that's why we drink because florida's really hurting in a lot of ways yeah. and uh people are hurting in a lot of ways and I talked about a demon, so I don't really know how much that's affecting other people, but it is hel- it's it's probably hurting someone out there who's no, also yeah. got a demon if going on. If you got on. a demon, just let us know because we want to know about it. I don't know how to regulate that one for you, um, but I have heard you can hang garlic, and and that'll be it. That's all you need. I to might do. do that anyway for my own mental health. I feel like that would be a nice smell for me to have. I would around. like to hang some roasted garlic over my dinner and then. <laughs> eat it with the rest <laughs> of my it. dinner um i love some roasted garlic oh what um maybe you should hang some garlic over your creepy little pictures christine Ooh, i'm still thinking about that one girl who was posing with her hat i just think she's so funny i think she is a champion and an icon well, we did find out the like 
no, we didn't find anything out, but we thought, oh, maybe she's doing that because like her husband was off at yeah. war or something. But well, um, it, no, wait, I don't think it was that. I think it was more that I, I, I don't know. Again, this might be just totally off base, but I think the way it was phrased was sometimes people would put like this, the uh the item of a a lost loved one so like and since that was like quite a woman's hat from back then i wonder if it was like her mother or like someone she'd lost you know yeah which makes us look like assholes but you know we didn't know we she looked like a fashionista you know if maybe it was mod it was a vet no (laughs) maybe it was that fucking mr nobody wearing that hat and we just can't see him I do like to think that even if I'm taking a picture and it's got like some sort of sad history to it, if in a hundred years it's making people giggle because I look really cool in some way or yeah. like a fashionista, I think I could be okay with that. If if she showed up today or if we went to her and we were like, girl, what is the story behind this picture? And then girl, she said something really morbid, everything. I'd feel so bad, but yeah. I'd, be, I'd be like, okay but this is what it looked like to us and like you were killing it you know yeah we rebranded it for you i hope it's okay yeah exactly oh well uh apparently tomorrow i will be checking the mail and seeing if um anyone sent me anything (laughs) like that and if you would like to send us stuff by the way because we do do (laughs) gift videos on patreon you can send it to 1920 uh north or 1920 hillhurst ave box 265 los angeles california 90027 that's right. And uh, when we say we do gift videos, I do not because I get my mail here in Kentucky, um, but I do open it all and uh, it brings me so much joy and I keep everything. It'd be cool uh, if you did. It'd be cool I if know, you did. I know. I did a couple. I did do a couple. Um, so maybe I'll... It, it's just hard because some of them are beach too sandy, so they get kind mm. of... It gets all mixed up. But I, I can definitely try to start doing that again. Um, but if you have sent something, um, don't worry. Your gifts are deeply appreciated. I've opened all of them and I love them all. And uh, for you can M, watch me and Eva open the gifts in Los Angeles. Open. That's right. And yeah. we have a great time with it. We make a whole day of it. We get Cheesecake Factory uh, delivered. It's a good time. So I just I just cry in my corner and wait wait for uh, the day. You, you can move back to LA, my friend. You have Yay. all the cheesecake you'd ever want. Uh, I'll. Here, how about I'll 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 put it on my card for you. Hey, f- totally free. One but cheesecake what on if you my card. Oh, a cheesecake, cheesecake factory. <laughs> I mean, I Speaking of which, could go eat some cheesecake at the cheesecake factory near my house. I just discovered the tiramisu cheesecake at cheesecake factory and it's oh, a game changer. Is that good? Game changer. I'm not like a huge tiramisu person. I'm a big tiramisu person. You know, it's always the people who don't drink that like tiramisu. Mm-hmm. Isn't that weird? Because it's like soaked in rum. Coffee, I thought. Oh. Which like one espresso am I thinking? or something? Oh, it's co- it's coffee. You're right. I'm sorry. But you also don't drink coffee. Interesting. I know. Well, I it's there's something about it. It feels like really l- I don't know what it is. I it I had to um there's a oh actually now that we're talking about it, I might get tiramisu on over here. That sounds um, delicious. There's a tiramisu that I'm obsessed with that gets delivered to my apartment, and I really got into it there. So then I think from there I was able to like try the more intense tiramisu's. Um, I mean, anyway, next time you come uh, over, I'll I'll show it to you. I want to be part of it. I will join you next time. Yeah, and then that's my favorite thing is introducing people to foods that I like because there's no way you can go wrong because either I've impressed you by giving you something you love or you hate it and now I get double and like now I you just, have yes yes you have you I have hate when I hate when I show someone a food that I like and they're afraid to tell me if they don't like it because I'm like well if you eat it to be nice and you hate it now we're both having a miserable time now because it's I a lose lose I could have eaten it and had a great time literally like. Why not just gift you with the rest? Yeah, so I'll buy you a tiramisu next time you're here, and then if you don't like it, wink, wink. I hope you don't like it. Then I I'll have twice the fun. So perfect. Okay, and also buy me one that I also like, so that I can sure. have something to enjoy. We'll see. And okay, that's <laughs> why we drink.